July 2nd, 2020, our monthly stormwater meeting. I'm gonna call the meeting to order. I'd like to begin by uh, uh, taking a roll call of all the stormwater committee members present. Um, so I'm gonna call out your name and if you'll just uh, turn on your mic and uh, let us know you're here. And then uh, 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 we'll go from there um, and uh, begin our meeting. So uh, Ms. Stokes, are you here? Okay, I see Ms. Stokes and I heard sound, but I'll, I'll assume that means you're here. Uh, Mr. Dale, are you present? Okay, I don't know if we're having some technical difficulty, but I'm not hearing anyone confirm their presence so far. So I'll proceed to Ms. Maddox, and we'll test it that way. Ms. Maddox, are you present? Hey guys, I can't hear anything. I'm not sure what's going on. Ms. Maddox, did that, was that you that spoke up? Yes, I'm here. Okay. All right, Ms. Uh, Ms. Adams Taylor, are you here today? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Gomez Velez, are you here today? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. All right, Ms. Stokes, can you turn on your mic and let us know if you're here? Um, I am here. I changed my settings. Is that better? It's perfect. Thank you. Great. Mr. Dale, are you present? And we can't hear you, Mr. Dale. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, if Mr. Dale could hear us, maybe um, maybe he needs to call in on the phone as well for the audio. Okay. That may be cool. Okay. All right. Well, it, if there's no objection from the other committee members, I'm going to proceed since I can see his name on the uh, text roll to the right. All right, so now that we have uh, uh, checked to see everyone's presence, let me make some public announcements. Um, for those of you who are listening to the live stream, if you, uh, if you wanna listen another way or wanna text a friend, uh, there is a call-in number where you can listen by phone. And that number is 415-655 zero 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 two one one five six five five zero zero two you're going to be asked for an access code to this meeting to listen by phone and that access code is one four six five two six eight one five five one four six five two six eight one five five and you'll see on the screen now those of you who are live streaming uh, those two numbers the call in number and the access code if you're just going to participate um, in the live public hearing and you want to comment on an individual case, you will call a different number. You'll call 629-255-1919, 629-255-1919. Um, you will not be asked for an access, access code, but you will be directed by an operator to uh, stay in a holding pattern and you'll be prompted to introduce yourself, uh, state your address, where you live in Davidson County, and then you'll have uh, a maximum of two minutes to share your perspective, either for or against a particular case that's being discussed at that particular moment. All right, thank you for sharing that on the screen. All right, so we have been, uh, we've properly taken a roll call, made all of our necessary public announcements. Um, I do need to, to reference uh, um, why we're meeting by uh, virtual uh, means today. Uh, and, uh, I'll recognize uh, Ms. Costonis at the moment if she'd like to, uh, to give our audience a summary of, of why we're meeting virtually and the legal precedent for that. 
Certainly, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, great. Um, so um, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the governor issued originally executive order 16, um, which um, despite the provisions of the Tennessee Open Meetings Act that would um, normally require this board and many others to meet in person, allowed um, electronic or virtual meetings to occur on a temporary basis. Um, during the outbreak. Um, and that um, executive order was then extended um, through June 30th and most recently through August 29th by executive order 51. Um, uh, so um, the prerequisite to being able to conduct business electronically is that the committee must adopt a motion that the items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this body and that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Thank you, Ms. Castonis. So at this time, uh, again, my name is Dodd Galbraith. I'm the chairman of the Metro Stormwater Committee. Uh, I'd like to ask a committee member if they would like to offer a motion to um, so move that an electronic meeting is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Please raise your hand if you'd like to be recognized electronically. There's a little hand symbol at the bottom of the participant screen. Okay, recognize Ms. Maddox. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, meeting as noted. All right, so we have a motion to approve the fact that we're meeting electronically to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Do we have a second? All right, Ms. Stokes. I'll second the motion. All right, so motion been made. Uh, Ms. Anna Maddox and property seconded by Committee member Carrie Stokes. Uh, seeing that there is no discussion, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor, say aye by roll call vote. All right, uh, Ms. Stokes, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Stokes votes aye. Mr. Dale. IT is still working, trying to help the, uh, Mr. Dale get on. Okay, um, Ms. Maddox. Aye. All right, uh, Ms. Adams-Taylor. Aye. All right, Dr. Gomez-Velez. Aye. All right, so we have a uh, quorum of members who have voted aye. The motion passes. Thank you for your participation. We'll wait on Mr. Dale to get connected here in a few minutes. Okay, so um, uh, let's see here. All right, so now we're at the point where we need to uh, consider uh, approval of our prior meetings, minutes, and decision letters. This would be our May 7th, 2020 meeting since we did not meet in June. Um, wanna give uh, everyone, on, everyone on the committee a chance uh, to state uh, whether or not they need more time to review the minutes or decision letters. I realize we've, uh, we've done a little bit of a last minute uh, um, uh, shuffling of how we would do this meeting today. So some of you may have had to adapt to that very late since the governor's order came out fairly recently and we thought we were meeting live and instead needed to switch uh, within a few days to a virtual meeting. Uh, I do have a couple of comments on the on the meeting minutes that I noticed uh, that I want to I want to reference um, and I may need legal's help in determining uh, to what extent uh, we need to address this but um, the first uh, item I noticed was um, uh, there's a reference in the uh, meeting minutes may only may also need to be reflected in the uh, decision letters uh, concerning um, the uh, uh, conditions for the approval of the variance involving 
the uh, River North project. And um, um, there's an item number six in that summary that says that um, uh, there, there shall also be a restrictive covenant or document recorded so that anyone purchasing these parcels is aware of the obligations and responsibilities that are in place per this variance ruling. I don't know that, that this needs to be said explicitly, but I remember us stating in our discussion and in the motion that, that these uh, potential tools should be negotiated and approved by Metro Stormwater staff. And I know in the past we've explicitly stated that. Uh, Ms. Costonis, do you see a need for us to state that explicitly or, or is that implied enough by virtue of uh, the, uh, the process? Um, I think it wouldn't hurt to state it explicitly, um, so long as it is consistent with what was stated at the meeting itself, which um, I'm afraid I, I can't remember um, specifically, but certainly um, when somebody files a real covenant or restrictive covenant um, to encumber their property with, with some obligation or restriction, um, in general, um, I, they can just do that, um, you know, just take it down to the Register of Deeds and record it. Um, and so certainly if we want to ensure that that language um, captures what we need it to, then it would be good to have the opportunity to review and approve that language before it is recorded. I, I just remember us going back and forth quite a bit uh, with staff uh, who offered um, experiences from past um, situations where there wasn't adequate documentation and there seemed to be quite a bit of expertise and experience among the stormwater staff and our legal representation to um, to ensure that um, that Metro government and the taxpayers of Davidson County wouldn't be stuck with um, unenforceable um, legal tools if um, significant changes of ownership occurred associated with some of these covenants and restrictive documents. Um, and uh, in it, uh, I know in the past, we have frequently, uh, as a matter of practice, encouraged um, the staff to take a stronger role in, in working out these types of details so that the committee would not be in the position of having to uh, um, uh, prescribe specific actions that, uh, that full-time professional staff would have a better insight into. And I'm, I remember the applicant being willing to work with staff on that, stating so. So can another committee member speak to uh, whether or not they, they share the same memory and if they feel like this is a good idea to make it more explicit? And I'll look for a raised hand, other committee members. All right, Ms. Maddox, you recognized. Um, I, I do recall having that discussion. Um, I think with my personal experience going through the grading permit process, um, that's generally something Stormwater would review anyways before they would grant an approval of a permit. Um, so I don't, I don't know that it's necessary to state that in there. I, I feel like stormwater does a thorough job and would, would just handle that on their own. All right, any other committee members have an opinion about that? Do we need to make it explicit? Uh, I think Ms. Costonis noted that they could file those covenants and deed restrictions potentially without any staff approval or engagement. Is that is that what you said, Ms. Costonis, or did I misunderstand that? I just realized I was speaking on mute, apologies. Um, yes, in theory, I think it would be possible for them to do that. Um, uh, I mean, it, certainly in terms of um, Metro being sort of the beneficiary of the covenant, 
um, Metro signature is not required on a restrictive covenant or real covenant. It takes only the signature of the property owner um, to um, uh, to um, uh, complete that document and um, be able to have it recorded with the register of deeds, um, which we would certainly want done. Um, but um, I could see, and this is perhaps you know kind of a more paranoid speculation, but it it would be you know, the sort of lawyer's jobs to anticipate those, right? Um, it would be possible for them to draft their own real covenant, um, record it, um, and then say that they had met the requirement in the um, variance. Um, uh, and maybe it wouldn't be exactly the language that we would have preferred had we had the chance to review and approve it. Um, so I, I do think that your concern is a reasonable one. I, I just cannot recall whether this was something that was discussed at the June meeting. I'm sorry. I mean, I recall that there was a discussion of concerns and issues that we had had, you know, with similar situations in the past, for sure. I just don't remember if if the way the, um, the condition on the variance was stated was that um, it had to be reviewed and approved by staff. Any other committee members want to weigh in on this? Ms. Maddox, you're recognized. I mean, I, I guess I'd be open to going back and listening to the meeting from last time to make sure, because I, I don't want to put it, I'm okay putting it in there if that's what we discussed for sure, um, just to cover our bases, but I don't I don't want to put that in there if nobody is 100% sure that that's what happened in our meeting. I remember it being discussed, I just don't remember how we articulated it in the motion, um, which right. is, um, yeah, which is the, the more pertinent aspect of this discussion. So, um, but I do remember uh, asking Mr. Yang where if that would be acceptable. So, okay, so um, what's the preference of the committee? Ms. Maddox, your hand's still raised if you'd like to be recognized. <laughs> no. All right, you removed it, okay. Any other comments from the committee? Would you like to proceed? Uh, uh, you know, we can, we can uh, entertain a motion to revisit this uh, on the video to ask Ms. Gilbert to review it, um, or we can uh, proceed with uh, other discussions of the minutes and decision letter. What's the will of the committee? All right, Ms. Stokes. Um, I am the same. I certainly remember the discussion, um, the question to the applicant, but I do not recall how it was phrased um, in the approval or in the um, <laughs> in the grant. So I, I kind of the same. I don't want to put it in there um, if that's not what was stated at the time, so. So um, uh, would it be appropriate to uh, proceed with the current approval subject to the review of the discussion uh, at, the, at that portion of the, um, of, of a, of, of a Verbalizing a motion and passing a motion, um, Ms. Stokes. I mean, Ms. Um, Costello. Um, so the um, because Stormwater um, uh, adopts the, the minutes and decision letters at the subsequent meeting. The significance of that is that the courts have found that if someone wishes to file an appeal by writ of certiorari um, uh, from that decision of the committee. 
um, the, um, the date from which their 60 days to do that starts to run um, is the date of the approval of the minutes and decision letters, not the date that the motion was actually adopted. Um, so if we are to adopt those minutes, like maybe adopt all the other provisions of the minutes from that day, except with that one, then it just makes that a little bit ambiguous. Um, I almost think it would be better just to defer the approval of the June minutes um, until the next meeting, um, uh, if, if that is the preference of the committee to um, enable the, um, uh, the review to occur um, and a clarification perhaps on that point um, in terms of um, how that provision is worded um, rather than kind of partially approving the minutes and, and, and leaving it contingent or something like that. I think that could just be confusing for those trying to calculate when there's 60 days to begin to run if, if there's an interest in doing that on anybody's part. So I'll, I'll state uh, the opportunity uh, and the challenge we have in, have in front of us this way. Um, um, we made a very um, significant decision to improve, to approve a slight uh, rise in uh, the uh, flood peak for this site with a variety of conditions that depend upon a variety of participants and the same uh, property owners and the same developer to all be in sync together. If any of those owners and any of, uh, any of the development interests change in the future uh, without clear uh, documentation to cover the conditions that this committee required of the applicant, it's gonna be, it's gonna make it very hard to ensure that flooding is not worsened on that side. So, uh, so the opportunity we have at the moment is to proceed without the um, explicit, um, without explicit awareness of what we chose to do in the prior meeting or to defer it until we could find that out. So what's the will of the committee? All right, Ms. Maddox. I'll make a motion to defer the approval of the June minute until our next meeting. Okay, Ms. Maddox has made a motion that we defer the approval of the minutes, and I assume, and the decision letters, Ms. Maddox? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And uh, is there a second? Okay. Um, Ms. Adams-Taylor. Sorry, I can't. I'll Both second. The bottom of the... All right, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Taylor seconded the motion. All right, do we have any discussion? Mr. Dale, would you like to add any comments since I missed your hand raised there? All right, seeing none, we have a motion that's been made and properly seconded. Is anyone, all right, Ms. Stokes, would you like to add some discussion? I, was just, I had a question. I did have some other um, requested changes. Would we just defer that we would just defer the discussion on those until next time, or would we speak to those later? Yes, ma'am. I think it would be appropriate since we're not going to act on the minutes and decision letters today that if you just keep a record of those changes and bring them back okay. next time. I would greatly Thank appreciate you. it. All right, without further objection, is there any further discussion before we vote on the motion? And I'm scrolling up and down the participant screen. I don't see any electronic hands raised, so I'll assume that means, since I can't see your facial expressions, that means you're ready to vote. So uh, I'll proceed with a roll call vote at this time to defer the approval of the minutes and decision letters. Uh, Ms. Stokes, uh, what is your vote? I approve. Ms. Stokes votes aye. Mr. Dale, what is your vote? Can you hear me, Don? Yes. Um, yes, sir, I hear you. 
Okay. Um, I've had technical difficulty. I'm doing this over my phone right now. You so sound I'll, great. I'll, uh, I'll vote yes. All right, Mr. Del votes yes. Ms. Maddox. Aye. I, I didn't hear that, but I noticed the technical aye. secretary Mark. Yes, aye. Okay. Ms. Adams. Aye. All right, Ms. Adams Taylor votes yes. Dr. Gomez Velas. Aye. All right. Okay, so we have a unanimous vote. Vote, uh, the motion passes. And uh, let's proceed to the next uh, business item. Okay. Um, sorry, folks, I'm having to scroll to get back to where we are on the agenda. Okay, so uh, at this time, now that we have uh, addressed the May 7th min minutes and decision letters and deferred action on those, we're ready to start our discussion of cases. I'm going to ask the um, representatives of the mansion at Fontenelle to uh, prepare themselves virtually to get ready for a presentation while we proceed with some introductory or routine introductory remarks. I also want to ask each committee member um, here today to, to refer to your electronic notes um, uh, to um, prepare any kind of questions or comments uh, that you'd like to ask uh, the applicant after they make their presentation. We'll also be open, opening up a public hearing for the public to participate in this as well. Uh, we mentioned previously that if you would like to call in to comment on this case, uh, that phone number is 629-255-1919, 629-255-1919. And th that number will be put up on the screen again later, and then you'll be prompted to speak. Uh, you'll introduce yourself, you'll state your address in Davidson County, and your whether you're for or against within two minutes. So at this time, uh, I'd like to ask um, uh, Ms. Gilbert to read our opening statement that each applicant uh, needs to hear in order to understand their legal rights. And then I'll ask Mr. Bowman to read the summary of the case. Uh, actually, Mr. Bowman may do all of that together, so. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna do all that. Excellent, um, thanks, sir. An opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Case number one on the agenda is case number 2020-0007, the mansion at Fontenelle. APN 04-0000-9300-04-0000-16300-049-0001400-049-0000-2000-1 and 049-0031900. Council District 3, Council Lady Jennifer Gamble. The address is 4225 White Creek Pike, Inspector is Boots O'Hara. Previous case descriptions. The mansion at Fontenelle was previously approved March 4th, 2010 under variance number 2010-00001 to allow the following. Disturbance of the floodway and 75 foot floodway buffer, 50 foot zone one and 25 foot zone two of White's Creek for maintenance of the existing buffer area, which shall include periodic mowing of the existing grass areas and to allow the installation of a gravel access drive to provide access to NES power poles across the buffer. The mansion at Fontenelle phase two and 2A was previously approved under variance number uh, 2010-00014 with conditions on August 5th, 2010 to allow the following. Disturbance of the 25 foot zone two buffer of White's Creek for construction and encroachment of gravel path Disturbance of the 30-foot zone one and 20-foot zone two buffer of an unnamed tributary to White's Creek for grading stone and timber walls, gravel walkways, pedestrian footbridge crossing, and temporary cabana structures. Continuous mowing and maintenance of the buffer on the north side of the unnamed tributary. Waiver of stormwater treatment measures for facilities on the south side of the unnamed tributary. 
The mansion at Fontenelle Phase 2 and 2A was previously approved under variance number 2010-00014 on rehearing October 7, 2010 from August 5, 2010 case to allow the following. Revisions to the previously granted variance, disturbance and encroachment of the 75-foot floodway buffer, 50-foot zone 1 and 25-foot zone 2 of Whites Creek for removal of a portion of existing unpermitted gravel parking area and construction to replace the remaining gravel with pervious concrete and concrete curb to remain. Disturbance and encroachment of the Whites Creek floodway to provide compensating cut 587 cubic yards for 533 cubic yards of unpermitted uncompensated fill gravel area in the 100-year floodplain BFE 485.8. Placement of existing stormwater best management practices BMP's infiltration trench and swell to remain in the buffer, unpermitted location. Fontenelle Southern Living House was previously approved December 5th, 2013, under variance number 2013-00020 to allow the following, placement of approximately 2,366.4 cubic yards of uncompensated fill in the White Creek floodplain. Fontenelle IHG Resort was previously approved December 5th, 2013, under variance number 2013-00022 to allow the following for map 49 parcel 140 to allow the disturbance of 30 foot zone one and 20 foot zone two stream buffer of an unnamed tributary to Whites Creek for widening of an existing road and insulation of a water line and force main in the existing road. To allow the spacing of two road crossings less than a thousand feet on an unnamed tributary to Whites Creek to allow the disturbance of the floodway 75 foot floodway buffer, 50 foot zone one, 25 foot zone two, for insulation of a private water line, for map 49 parcel 198, to allow the disturbance of the floodway, and 75 foot floodway buffer, 50 foot zone one, and 25 foot zone two, for insulation of a private water line. Requesting preliminary approval, new ownership to amend and combine previous active variances and request of new variances. Applicants request is to allow the following. Uncompensated fill, stream and stream buffer disturbance, flood and floodway disturbance, continuous mowing and maintenance. The appellant is Blue Road Fontenelle LLC, represented by Clay Wallace, Energy Land and Infrastructure. Comments. Stormwater staff, staff would like the applicant to provide a more complete description of the hardship that ne necessitates the water quality buffer parking and event space requested. The details should include the number and specific types of events, the event durations, the required parking for each type, and the items that will be in the buffer, including any equipment required for delivery and removal. Staff wants the applicant to consider if events could be consolidated to limit the areas of continued, continued buffer maintenance. Staff requests that additional areas be designated as no disturbed buffers. Staff requests additional buffer mitigation plan details, including exactly where trees and other vegetation will be planted and how vegetation will be managed. It should include the requested frequency of mowing. Areas that will be allowed to permanently revegetate should also be clearly indicated. Codes had no comment provided. Planning proposed variance request is consistent with the SB and the issuance of previous stormwater variances. Greenways. Staff requests that the boundaries of the existing greenways conservation easement be clearly shown on the applicant's exhibits for the variance request. Staff requests a more detailed description of the need for the amount and extent of proposed event space and parking. Staff requests that the parking and event space be downsized. The amount of area requested for parking conflicts with the conservation intent of the greenways conservation easement held by Metro Parks on this property. The current easement restricts vehicular travel to a designated shared use segment of, tra of trail. Staff requests a detailed plan indicating traffic flow and traffic control measures for the current shared use portion of the trail and to designate any proposed shared use segment on the new trail. Staff requests that the applicant coordinate with staff to locate and provide a greenways conservation easement on the proposed new trail loop, as well as a new greenways conservation easement that will connect to the existing easement and to the intersection of White Street Pike and Knight Drive. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Okay.
So um, I want to remind the general public that they'll have uh, uh, in a few minutes the opportunity to speak for or against this case. Um, uh, and uh, we referenced a uh, call in number, but I'll repeat it 629 255 1919, 629 255 1919. Please be prepared to uh, state your name, where you live, and Davidson County, your address, and whether you're for or against within two minutes. So is the applicant ready to uh, present their case? And who will be speaking? Please. Yes, this is this is John Haas with Edge Planning, Landscape Architecture and Urban Design, uh, co-applicant on the um, on the application for the revised variance. Okay, John, and uh, could you um, uh, introduce everyone who is available to take questions from members of the committee? that might provide the technical insight into your proposal. Absolutely. Um, so with me uh, on the phone, as far as I can tell today, is uh, uh, number one, and, and probably most importantly, and I'm gonna give her an opportunity to speak before I do, if it's all right with the, uh, with the chairman, um, is Councilwoman Jennifer Gamble. Uh, we also have our, uh, the, property owner from Blue Road Ventures, Tim Farrell on the line. Uh, and from a technical standpoint, I have Clay Wallace uh, from Energy Land and Infrastructure, our civil engineer for the project, and Tom Boyd from Edge, who is our project manager. Excellent. Okay, John, if you don't mind, and with all due respect to the council representative, our meeting guidelines usually uh, integrate the feedback from uh, council representatives at the beginning of the public hearing. Uh, we wanna make sure that our council representatives uh, before they offer their perspective hear your public representation of what you're proposing. And so if, if you'll go through your technical presentation first, I'll be sure to, to open up uh, the public hearing for the council representative first. Is that uh, acceptable to you? Uh, absolutely, I defer to your your regulations and rules and, and just wanted to be yeah. respectful of Councilwoman Gamble's time. So uh, absolutely, sorry, we can do sorry. that. Uh, if, if I yeah. might, uh, however, if you'll just allow me uh, a couple of minutes, he wanted to be here in person, um, but with the virtual, uh, I'd, I'd just like to introduce very quickly, Tim Farrell, the, the current owner of the property to before we get into our technical presentation. That's that's no problem at all. That, uh, he's he's part of that. So uh, so proceed as you wish. You have uh, ten minutes starting now. Okay. Go ahead, Tim. Great, thank you, John. Uh, members of the committee, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's a pleasure to uh, be here, albeit virtually. Just a, a few quick words. Uh, wanted to outline our goals for this property, and and those are simply to develop a project that celebrates the natural beauty of this place, uh, creates a unique inviting experience for our guests, including the surrounding community, uh, and, and lessens or limits the impact of the, of the development. And then finally, a project that is, of course, financially viable. Um, in terms of lessening the impact, I think you'll see today that we've created a project that not only celebrates the natural environment, but uh, compared to the previous project, reduces the impact and minimizes the disturbance. Uh, finally, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, in addition to working closely with Councilwoman Gamble uh, and the community itself, we have worked closely and committed to working closely with the stormwater staff. Uh, in fact, the very first meeting uh, that I had uh, with a group outside of our internal team was with the stormwater staff uh, as we were in our due diligence process for uh, acquiring this property. Uh, and the purpose of that, that early meeting with stormwater staff was to introduce uh, the new ownership group. Uh, and I you know, emphasize that we are the, the new ownership group. I understand and know that this property has a, a long history uh, but we are a, a new group and committed to working with all parties to, to move this project ahead. Um, so in addition to introducing uh, us as the new owners, 
uh, also wanted to commit to working with stormwater staff to to really clean up and simplify uh, the existing variances that, that were in place. Uh, and I think you'll see today in our presentation and our discussions that, that we are attempting to do as much. So uh, thank you again for your time. Appreciate being here and look forward to the discussion. Thank, thank you, sir. We appreciate it very much. All right, Mr. Haas, um, and a, again, if you could clarify again that this is a preliminary uh, request and not your final uh, variance request, uh, uh, is that is that still true? Yes, absolutely. So um, right. if I may, I think, um, you know, having Mr. Farrell speak uh, it is sort of the essence of this request is, uh, um, as he mentioned, new ownership uh, of the property, took control of the property, um, I believe, uh, last fall. Um, and uh, the previous owners had essentially um, ran out of operations, ran out of funding, and, and uh, some of that had to do with the Woods Amphitheater, some of it had to do with other operations and so on. Uh, but what's important is I think what we did in this for the preliminary SP, we wanted to do very much with stormwater. And when we met with stormwater staff, it, this is something we agreed upon is the current list of variances, which were read uh, a few moments ago, are multiple variances. Some have expired, some have changed, some have been amended, some are easy to enforce, some are not so easy to enforce. and our goal of this preliminary and of this variance request is to simplify that process, combine all of these variances into one, um, and, and clean up some of the lessons learned over the last 10 years with the previous ownership. Um, it's exactly what we went through on the preliminary SP with Councilwoman Gamble and the community. Um, and the community uh, also had comments on on uh, stormwater and and things of that nature, and we've incorporated those into this. So, uh, with that said, the biggest change in operations, uh, I think it's important to understand, is the previous ownership were owners from the music industry. This property, what the focus of this property was the Woods Amphitheater. Um, and the focus of a number of the variances was the use of that Woods Amphitheater holding up to 5,000 people within that amphitheater at certain times of the year for up to 18 times a year. The current owner is a, a 180 from that, if you will. Um, they are uh, hotel resort operators. That will be the focus of the property. The Woods Amphitheater, which is the biggest change that you will see is no longer, uh, will no longer be in existence. However, that does not mean that, and I think this is where some of the confusion lies in my conversations with uh, with Parks and even with, with Councilwoman Gamble and, 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 it, and during the SP process. That does not mean we will no longer host events. It's even more important now as a hotel operator that no longer has an amphitheater to create uh, income that events are permitted to happen on the property in a number of different ways. And you'll see here in a minute that, uh, and I'll go through this as quickly as I can. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, there are a number of variances here that we're trying to clear up and that's why we're doing this preliminary so we can have this as a discussion, make sure that you agree with the lessons learned in our approach. Um, so with that said, I think the hardships that were there previously are, are in existence today. And number one being that um, the overall site, 180 some acres, we are limited to 25% um, development impact on the site with our SP. So there uh, is very limited area that we can physically make improvements. Um, and we agree with that. Again, speaking to the low impact of Mr. Farrell, that's exactly the approach that we want to take. Um, but it does create some hardships for us in terms of hosting some events. Um, also, I think Mr. it's- Mr. Haas. Mr. Haas. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do something a little unorthodox here since we're working virtually. 
I, I just want to remind you, you've got about three minutes left. Okay. So if you could just focus specifically on what you're asking us to do, that'd be, that'd be great. Okay. I, I, I was trying to address the staff comments. That's fine. Uh, so if you can go to the, the first slide, Tom. So this is just preliminary SP. That's what exists today. If you can go to the next slide. We went over the variances that are in place. These are the variances that we're amending. Next slide. One important thing that I'm not sure everyone is aware of is there is a stormwater management plan for this property, and it is the most extensive stormwater management plan that exists within Metro. I think it's one of two stormwater management plans um, for, for this type. And within that stormwater management plan, there are some restrictions, if you can go to the next slide, Tom, uh, that really talk about how we manage this floodway buffer. And if there are events and if there are people parking there, we want to keep all that in place and make improvements as we work with staff on that. If you can go ahead, Tom. Um, one of the things that that does is we established with stormwater staff a sample, a, a very simplified event form, which says, there's a tier one, tier two, tier three. And if we have a type of event, we're gonna submit some paperwork so you're aware of it, you know what's going on. And um, we, in some cases, take additional BMP measures. That will stay in place as well. You can go to the next slide. Keep going. So our, our new SP, we have several areas and, and most of this is focused on mowing. I'll go through this very quickly. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Tom, keep going to where we get to the graphics. This is what was submitted, but this is a simplified version. So we are requesting in this particular area to the area in purple is to only hold events, no parking. What we've done is we are proposing an additional greenway trail, working through that with parks, including an extension up to Knight Road. And what we are saying now is that we will have all of the area outside of the trail, so to speak, that area in green will return to native vegetation. The area in the purple will be mowed on a periodic basis. We, we want to host events in that field, or at least have the potential to host events in those two fields. Next slide. This is currently what the current SP addresses. However, it's a larger area. These are the areas that are reserved for parking and for events. What we've done is reduced it and added additional natural vegetation buffers around these parking areas. It is not our intent to use all of these parking areas at one time, which was the case with the previous Woods Amphitheater. Our intent is to rotate these fields around with the uses, and we can talk about that when we get to the questions. But in the orange, we would want to park sometimes, we would want to hold events sometimes. The green, again, um, is natural vegetation that will be restored on the property. Next slide. Okay. Uh, property to the hey, south. Mr. Yes. Yes, Mr. Hoss, you're, you're at your time. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, for the committee to. Uh, consider a motion for um, uh, suspension of the rules to, to give you uh, another five minutes to, uh, to summarize uh, this since we're, since we're working under pretty unusual circumstances with having gone from a potential live meeting to a virtual meeting. I'm sure that's made planning for this presentation um, unusual. So uh, could I have a committee member uh, offer a motion to briefly suspend the rules to give them five more minutes. All right, Ms. Ronan Adams-Taylor. Yes, I make a motion to allow the applicant an additional five minutes to continue his presentation. All right, Mr. Dale, are you recognized to give a second? I am. All right, thank you, sir. A motion has been made and properly seconded to suspend the rules temporarily to give the applicant five more minutes due to the unusual circumstances of the preparation for this meeting today. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. So if it's okay uh, with uh, our staff at legal counsel, I'm going to accept that as a unanimous vote. And then uh, 
Mr. Haas, please proceed. You've got five more minutes starting now. Thank you. The uh, field, uh, most the the most uh, easterly field, or I guess southern field, uh, on on the property. Now, this property is not part of the preliminary SP, but in the past, it had been utilized for events and for parking. There's been some discussion with staff. It has never been rezoned. It is currently zoned agriculture. Um, however, there was some development on the property with the Greenway. This was one of the previous variances that allowed us to install a water line across here um, adjacent. Uh, and the Greenway went in, but the water line did not. So part of that is for us to go back and put the water line in and again, use some of this area for, for parking. Now, the difference in this area is we are limited in our SP as to how many events we can have, over, ticketed events over 2,500 people. Our intent would be only to use this area for parking if we have an event over 2,500 people. So the other four fields that I mentioned previously would be on a rotation basis, this field would only be used for parking for our larger events. If you go to the next slide. So the rest of this, if you can keep going, Tom, is it pertains to the stream as it goes back towards the mansion. Um, if you can zoom in, Tom. So previously, uh, one of those variances talked about a um, stream buffer disturbance where there were temporary box seats. Um, those were in the zone one and zone two buffer. It has become dilapidated. Um, there were railroad ties, it's falling apart. Uh, the landscape hasn't been maintained well from the previous owners. We are proposing to re repair or replace all of that work within this buffer. In addition to that, um, we are requesting that four of our bungalow units be permitted to be placed within the zone two buffer. These are areas that are already disturbed. And as part of that um, renovation and improvement, we would place those in the zone two buffer. The reason for that and the hardship for that is the fire marshal is requiring all of these units to be within 150 feet of fire truck access. There's two ways we can do that here. We can build a vehicular bridge, emergency access vehicular bridge across the stream that would have about an 80 foot span to go from buffer to buffer um, and result in some grading up to two 10 foot walls on the high side of the stream. We think that's excessive. We think that's counterintuitive and counterproductive to the stream buffer. So we're requesting that what we do is if we are permitted to do a grass ring, um, pervious surface, stabilized surface within the zone two buffer on that side that allows that 150 feet and, and therefore uh, indicates where those units need to be. Um, and again, that would be a, a repair and revegetation and complete uh, mitigation plan for that area as well. Keep going, Tom. Looks like I might have about two minutes left. Keep going. So the this other part, yes, sir. Okay, so this other part is there's an existing private drive. The fire marshal is requiring us to widen that private drive. That drive exists within the zone, uh, in some cases, zone one, most cases, zone two buffer. We are taking steps previously that was approved at 20 foot wide with uh, two foot shoulders on either side. We've requested with the fire marshal and been successful in reducing that to 16 foot wide with two foot shoulders on either side. So we reduced that impact because there's no longer vehicular access permitted. So it's only emergency access back here. We're requesting that variance be reinstated, essentially amending it. And we had some conditions in terms of improvements would be made away from the creek. We would continue to do those. There's also some uh, minor stream crossings that are pedestrian bridges uh, to, to again, allow fire access to some of these units, not from a truck, but from a, a hose and, and pedestrian, they would, they would walk the hose up to them. 
And then the last part of that variance is the loop road um, for the majority of the units. There are two vehicular bridge crossings that the fire marshal is requesting to have fire truck access up to those units. And that in, in, in turn precipitates the two bridge crossings. Again, that was part of a previous variance as well. I, I think that's okay, as much as I can do. I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can. Thank you, Mr. Haas. And uh, I just want to point out again for members of the public who will be speaking in a minute, and uh, first our council representative who's here and members of the committee, this is a preliminary approval. Our goal here is to try to give um, the applicant guidance that it's worth their time to go into a more detailed analysis of these various requests, which will involve quite a bit of engagement with stormwater staff, and then they'll be coming back to us for the final. So, so even though we've gone probably into a little more detail than we would normally go into with a preliminary approval like this, um, it, it, it's very much appreciated. We, we thank you, Mr. Haas, for helping us see kind of where you're headed with this so we can give you a better idea um, uh, in terms of a preliminary approval if we think you're going in the right direction. And um, so in a few minutes, we'll open up the committee for comments. So at this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing uh, I'm going to invite uh, council representative to uh, speak first. And again, want to remind the general public, you can call in at 629-255-1919. And I think we even have a live kiosk in the uh, Richard Fulton, on Richard Fulton campus, uh, where you can go to speak there live if you'd like as well. So council representative, you're recognized if you'd like to speak for two minutes, even for or against this, this project. But Thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you all for your service. Uh, this is my first uh, Stormwater Management Committee uh, meeting. As you know and have heard, this uh, particular mansion at the Fontenelle Project um, has had a long history, about 12 years, several different owners, uh, a couple of different plans and, and, and different variances. I became involved uh, with the project uh, with the new owner after being elected uh, last August, and since that time, have had um, very uh, quite a few uh, interactions with the the new owner Tom Farrell and, and John Haas, the principal on the project. Uh, we've had quite a few uh, community meetings to get uh, community engagement or a great community engagement in the project. In addition, we've had email correspondence and, and telephone calls with the community over the past nine months. Uh, to to make sure that uh, things that have may have been a problem in the past with the previous owners and projects were addressed in the new SP uh, that was uh, approved by the Planning Commission and is going uh, for third reading before the council next Tuesday. Um, I just want to say that uh, in my experience in working with uh, the new owner uh, over the past nine months, he has been very engaged and very uh, receptive and responsive to the community concerns regarding the, the Fontenelle, uh, regarding flooding, regarding regarding traffic, uh, and other instances uh, with the pro with the property. Uh, so I just I think they've done a lot of uh, work in this and working with the uh, planning staff, um, working with stormwater, working with the community and, and working with myself on this project. And we look forward to continuing to, to do that and working with the stormwater uh, committee. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to address you today. Thank you, ma'am. We're uh, okay, always ma pleased to have a uh, member of the Metro Council here to give us your unique uh, insight into things that affect uh, uh, an area of the county that you know extremely well. So your insight is always very helpful. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so at this time, I uh, want to open it up to uh, the general public to provide comments. So we'll start with, um, with that uh, public hearing process. Um, it's my understanding from prior practice that uh, we cannot group you by those four uh, in a group of some of the first respondents and then a group of those against second. So you'll have to tell us um, your name, your address at Davidson County, where you live, where you reside, and whether or not you're for or against it. And we'll take those as they as they're queued up. So do we 
we have anyone who's in the queue who's ready to speak. Are you there? Yes, we have callers in the okay, queue. Yeah, just make sure you have your TV. Oh, one moment. Turned off. Okay, and, and we can hear the uh, operator in the background and stuff. Okay. 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 Hello? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you state your name, your address, and your, whether or not you're for or against within two minutes? Yep, Elise Hudson, 4601 Whites Creek Pike, just about a half a mile down from the corner uh, where the new field is on Night Drive. Um, so we've lived in the area, um, my family's been in the area for, for a long time. We've been at this property for over a decade. And I want to point out that even though we've had public hearing on the SP, we haven't really had any community meetings or communication about these specific variances. So the people who live the closest to this property are just now, like this week, finding out about these specific variances that they're trying to renew and, um, and, and make changes to. So also, I sent over some pictures, some photographs of the area that had flooded. This area floods very frequently. Um, the maps were updated in 2017, and my pictures are from 2018 and er, late 2018, early 2019, including some video. When this area barely floods and doesn't go above the banks of White's Creek, down further on in White's Creek, it's actually already over the banks into Buena Vista Road and some of the houses down there. So we know White's Creek is, a, is an area that has a lot of problems. We know that Metro Stormwater has addressed this on multiple occasions. All we're asking is we need full impact studies and anything that you guys approve, make sure that it doesn't add to the already big problems that this area has. Um, we've already got, I think it's over 500 homes for this particular watershed that have not yet been built that will also come into effect and, and impact White's Creek itself and the drainage. Um, I want to ask questions specifically because we don't have maps. The public wasn't given any maps or, or a lot of the information Stormwater was requesting. We don't have either, so we, we'd like to see that before the final approval. Um, and we want to make sure that, like, there's an area where he was talking about adding bungalows along the unnamed tributary to the, to the White's Creek. Just make sure that that area doesn't flood because they're going to be using golf to park folks. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. All right, thank you, ma'am. All right, so you, you met your two minutes. We really appreciate your feedback. And I think this is, since this is a preliminary approval, uh, there's certainly time uh, to ensure that the community gets uh, more information and more feedback. We very much appreciate your insight. All right, so do we have another caller in the queue? Mm -hmm. This is uh, not an intentional musical break, so we're obviously going to have a little bit of technical difficulties. So we're expecting our second citizen comment. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, please state your name, your address, and whether or not you're for or against the, the preliminary proposal and why in two in two minutes Sarah, okay. Sarah Bellows, I live at four zero four uh, ma'am we I think we've lost you okay um I'm gonna ask uh, the operator to try to reach out to that previous caller and see if they can get them back in the queue I'll give them about 10 more seconds to see if we can work it out. Okay, sounds like we're not gonna be able to make that call work. So if y'all could try to um, help that person get reconnected later in the queue. So let's, why don't we proceed to the third person in the queue? We've got the next one coming in. Thank you, ma'am. Y'all are doing great. We really do appreciate our Metro employees making this work so well. 
with the limitations that we have technologically. I'll remind members of the public, the number you can call in is 629-255-1919. We're currently reviewing a preliminary approval for uh, consolidation of prior variances and new changes. This is a preliminary approval for the mansion and the Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, would you state your name, your address, and whether you're for or against the proposal and why within two minutes, please? Thank you so much. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to the members of the committee. My name is Gladys Herrera, and I have a residential property at 609 Cherry Grove Lane. It's about 1,500 feet from this property of Fontenelle. With approximately 108 property owners within 1,500 feet of this venue of Fontenelle, that include homeowners on Knight Road, Cherry Grove Lane, Weiss Creek Pike, Buena Vista, I'm asking that the storm that your committee consider the probable harmful impact of these four additional requested variances. I am not aware of any neighborhood meetings being called to discuss these additional variances, especially the slides that were shown today to you guys. Uncompanied. Ma'am, uh, have you accidentally muted your call or can the operator tell us if she's been disconnected? because we're not hearing any audio right now. So I'll give it about 10 more seconds and then we'll move on to the next person in the queue. All right, I apologize to the members of the public for our technical difficulties. There's certainly a lot of things that are out of our control. Um, so if, if we can try to reach that person again and get them back in the queue, uh, why don't we proceed to the fourth person in the queue at this time. Okay, we have one of the columns back on the line. Excellent. All right, if you could just state your name, your address, and whether you're for or against the proposal and why in two minutes. Sure, thanks so much, Sarah. Bellow is 4041 Night Drive, uh, directly across from the subject property is my residence, and my husband, David Kearns, and I also own the land at 4037 Night Drive and 4411 and 4415 Judy Creek Road. Um, it's not really possible to say for or against, but I think from a preliminary uh, perspective, there, uh, the community has not been kept up to date with the um, request. In fact, we were told at the SP meeting that there were really no stormwater changes. And obviously, um, this is, goes beyond a cleanup of the um, previously requested variances. There is there is a lot more being asked of the community in terms of bearing stormwater um, and potential flooding. When Fontenelle was first approved in March 2010, uh, I'm sure as you all know, our big flood was in May 2010. Um, we own six of the properties directly upstream from this property and we did not suffer any economic damage. In fact, my husband was the one pulling people out of the Fontenelle property in our Jeep. Um, and I know that since that period, there has been several more flooding events that are past the 100-year flood mark that we saw in 2010 uh, that were actually a lot worse. I know that you've received some public comments about that, including um, some from other residents in White's Creek, so I won't go into too much detail. Uh, but just to go into, um, I won't touch on the public record part too much. I think Elise Hudson already did that before she was cut off on the call. but. I would say that Edge developer 
has been the developer for all of the Fontenelle um, variance requests. So while I do appreciate the new owner and their commitment to, um, to environmental protection, this is an extremely sensitive area, extremely steep slopes. We had a landslide uh, going into White Creek. Obviously, you all know about the landslide about a mile away from this property on I-24. It's a very fragile slope area and the very high amount of flood flooding as well. Um, so I would Thank say that. What's that? Ma'am, I, th I think you're at your two minutes. I, I realize you got cut off. So can you just in one sentence, just kind of state your closing? I would say from a preliminary perspective, I would request that this is denied until more information um, on the specifics of both the Greenway plan, the parking areas, and the bridges are a huge concern. Uh, they're way too low Thank right you. now and they back up much debris. And so that's not addressed at all through this and really needs to be before preliminary can be approved. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. okay. So let's, um, let's go to our next caller. Sorry to have to intervene for you folks, but we, to be fair to everybody, we do have to limit it to each person to two minutes and will be a little more flexible than for folks who've been cut off. Without objection. Thank you. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you uh, state your name, your address in Davidson County and whether you're for or against the proposal and why within two minutes? And I'll start the clock when we start speaking. I was previously on and we got disconnected. I heard the music and I was like, oh, I think I got disconnected. <laughs> anyway. Yes, ma'am. Good morning to everyone. And my name is Gladys Heron with the proper residential property at 609 Cherry Grove Point, which is about 1,500 feet from Fontenelle Venue. Along with me, yes, there are approximately another 108 property owners within this 1,500 feet. And um, I just want to say I'm not aware of any neighborhood meetings being called to discuss these additional variances, especially the slides that were shown today. Um, I am mainly saying that these four additional requested variances should not be approved at this time. Uh, any uncompensated field should not occur to ensure the safeguarding of the, the lives and the property of the homeowners who are in this nearby neighborhood. It appears that the best prevention of future flooding, which we all have records of for the last few years in this area, is for in this residence, um, residential neighborhood should be to maintain the stormwater standards set for the area without any more variances. Your consideration of the safety and the welfare of the homeowners who actually live nearby this business venue would be greatly appreciated. And thank you all so much for allowing us to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your perseverance, ma'am. We really appreciate it. Okay, we have another caller in the queue. There are no more calls in the queue. Okay, so um, I can, uh, I think, safely assume that uh, we've heard from our, our Metro Council representative uh, and two or three callers. Um, and uh, having no one else in the queue, I'm going to close the public hearing at this time and then uh, open it up for the uh, for the committee. And uh, Mr. Mishu, please, uh, please uh, offer any help that you can offer right now. Yes, sir. I just wanted to add that there's nobody at the Sunny West Conference Room uh, in here in support or against the project. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that you're serving in that location as well. We're trying to be very thorough and giving folks opportunities to speak during this unusual pandemic. All right, so and we this are. Is, um, Rebecca, yes, I'd like Mr. to request Chairman. that uh, uh, Tom, Rebecca, Tom, I would like to request that Tom Boyd um, release presenter status and, and reassign it to me so I can put up the GIS. Okay, Mr. Right. Boyd, would yeah, you? To figure that out, and I will do that as soon as possible. All right, Mr. Bowman, uh, you're recognized. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that we got several uh, emails from um, 
different individuals that were included in your package. I have a list of uh, names that I'd like to read and addresses for the record of those individuals that sent in uh, emails and, and letters all in opposition to the project. Um, Angela Williams at 7203 Old Hickory Boulevard, White Street, Tennessee. Barbara Smith at 228 Solness Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee. Elise Hudson at 4601 White Creek Pike, White Creek, Tennessee. George Ewing at 4601 White Creek Pike, White Creek, Tennessee. Lindsay Seifert at 4007 White Creek Pike, White Creek, Tennessee. Christopher Seifert at 4007 White Creek Pike, White Creek, Tennessee. Zachary Dyer at 681 Brick Church Lane, White Creek, Tennessee. Nina Fort Meyer. 5267 Simpkins Road, White Creek, Tennessee, and Gladys Heron at 609 Cherry Grove Point, White Creek, Tennessee. All right, Mr. Bowman, how many people did that constitute? Nine people. You should okay. have, you should all have right. all those letters in your packages. All right, we apologize for the public. Uh, normally, uh, when we get just a few emails, we read the contents of the emails, but that's uh, time prohibitive, but it's uh, it's uh, clear all those folks so uh, have asked to express their dissent for the proposal. All right, so now we're, uh, we're open for uh, committee member discussion only. Um, our uh, meeting uh, rules uh, that have been created by this committee or by a prior committee uh, dictate that uh, each committee member may ask questions of the applicants and any of their representatives who may have technical technical expertise and help us understand better uh, what's in front of us. And Mr. Dale, you're recognized. Uh, all right, I need to make sure you can hear me, Don. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> this property, I mean, it's had a very long history. We've all been around for a long time. We know about all the different variances that have been requested and all the different venues that have occurred out here. Um, I think I'd be correct in telling the public that this is a, a preliminary. We're not, we're not granting approval of anything today. All we're really doing is discussing the merits of what's being proposed and, and more or less directing this applicant on what needs to be done. It, it sounds like, you know, just based upon the first blush that this new ownership has indicated the desire to create, you know, a more natural venue uh, and, and to more or less deviate from the venue that exists today. Um, they, there probably is a need, I mean, just like was stated, uh, anytime there's a, 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 an event out there, there's a long process which needs to be uh, addressed and, and, a, and applications made and submittals to Metro and reviews. And I think it's com complicated, it's convoluted. And so there probably is a need to to, to, put, to wrap these things all up into maybe one request so that they can be clearly understood. Uh, it's clear also based upon the testimony that the council member has had a lot of community meetings and uh, they have a good council member here. I think that the, the intent of most of those meetings was to talk about the uses, the changes of the venues, but based upon prior history, I know community also has concerns about storm drainage. And to me, you know, before we get into much discussion, any motion that's made, I would hope that we would encourage the applicant or almost require the applicant when he comes back to provide us some kind of evidence that they've had a meeting in the community just to address stormwater. And I, I think that that would actually be a very well received meeting, but it appears to me they're doing a lot of a pretty good things. Um, I do have a question of the applicant, however, um, when we showed these large areas, these orange areas, it looks like they're trying to provide some natural vegetation around the perimeters, and they're talking about using these overflow areas for parking, and they're going to try to rotate them. But I'm wondering if would there be ever be a, a, an occasion where all of those areas would be used at one time for parking, and if they were used at one time, how many vehicles could those uh, those con consolidated combined areas contain. So that's that's my first question. 
Mr. Haas, you're recognized. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Um, you know, what I will say is uh, to answer your question directly about it, would they ever be all used at one time? Some things with the SP that happened that, that were tied to stormwater were previously with the Woods Amphitheater, they were permitted to have 18 events per year up to 5,000 people, which equated to about 2,500 cars on average. In those cases, all four of these fields that are labeled, I think, B through E were utilized. One of the things we've done to address that, I'm sorry, it's A, B, C, and D were utilized. One of the things we've done to address that is said, changed our limit to 12 events greater than 2,500 people that were ticketed. That becomes our new maximum. In that case, when we are over 2,500 people, we would utilize the field to the south. So the, the short answer to your question is, there is, it is not anticipated that we would use all of these fields at once under any scenario. What we want the ability to do because we have the stormwater management plan in place is move cars, and, and we talked about it this way. I talked about this with the council councilwoman yesterday. If, for instance, we have an, a, a large wedding this Saturday, and there are 500 people at the wedding, so that necessitate, necessitates overflow parking into one of these fields. They may be in field D. There's a huge rain event, so the field gets muddy. We get the cars out. The stormwater management plan requires that to immediately be addressed, roped off, not utilized, reseeded and resodded within 48 hours, reseeded or resodded within 48 hours. And then we can no longer use that field. So that's where the rotation comes in because we may have an event two days later, but we're gonna rotate them. So um, most of our events out here and, and the key number that we landed on, and this was very much tied to our stormwater management plan, was 750 attendees. That a majority of our events are gonna be less than 750 attendees. And we would rotate parking for those overflows. And again, the types of events are gonna be a little bit different than before. The major concern before was the big event at the Woods Amphitheater. Now we're talking about more weddings, more corporate events, uh, more community events, those types of things. Right. Thank you for that precise answer. Um, uh, there's another question. I noticed that on the plans that I've looked at last night, there were two buildings, I guess, that occur within the floodway uh, or the floodway buffers that you're proposing to maybe change or do uh, re revisions to or improvements on. Uh, or is there, in your request, is there something that constitutes a variance that you would have to be asked that we would have to approve in order for you to do that work? Yeah, one of the things as this has been evolving, there are two buildings that exist within the floodway that were existing structures that were residential structures previously um, that have been purchased by the previous owners and were part of the property sale. The, there are no improvements specifically proposed for those areas. However, we do, it's my understanding, it was brought to my attention that we may have to request a variance. We wanna remove the swimming pool and the pool deck that's in the floodway that's associated with those two structures. But other than that, there would be no improvements. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and something else that I probably didn't quite understand you were talking about uh, bridge crossings, I guess, required by the fire marshal. Do those crossings currently exist? Uh, I know you have indicated that maybe there was a variance granted involving those. So um, are there new crossings being proposed? There are uh, two new crossings being, two new vehicular crossings on the tributary, not on Whites Creek, on the tributary, on the unnamed tributary that I say new, but again, um, I think part of the confusion here is 
in, in our eyes, these are not new variances. These are variances that exist with, with the property and we're trying to amend them and improve upon them. And so one of the, those two bridges were previously approved that has since expired and we're requesting that to be reinstated. But those are the two vehicular bridges. There are some pedestrian bridges that the fire marshal is saying he wants direct access within 150 feet to each of these units. Um, and because one of the hardships are with this unnamed tributary, uh, as I said before, we've got 25% of the property that we can use for development. Um, the, the intention is that these bungalows are in wooded environments. We do not have any structures. We are not proposing any structures in any way within the floodplain, not the, just the floodway within the floodplain. There are four structures proposed in the zone two buffer near the woods amphitheater portion and again that's an area that's already been disturbed and is in pretty sad shape i think we'll bring photos next time it needs to be addressed um so we're going to disturb that area uh we think it's an improvement to do that um but outside of that the the bridge crossings are pedestrians midway up the pedestrian crossings midway up the private drive to the mansion and then um, I, I don't have control of the pointer, but there's two vehicular crossings of that unnamed tributary that have to happen for, for the fire marshal. Do you have any knowledge about any flooding to any of the buildings that are within the existing development? Within the existing development, uh, in May of 2010, I have photos. Um, and, and, and you know very well, Mr. Dale, that we, we do, we go through these calculations and we count upon professionals like yourself to, to make those calculations as to what the flood elevation is and what finished floors should be and the compensating cut and fill. The buildings have not flooded. To the best of my knowledge, the buildings have not, the proposed buildings have not flooded. Now, some of the existing structures that are below the floodplain elevation that were there. there, there's a little stone house, um, the existing log cabin, those have flooded, uh, but the proposed structures have not flooded. Okay, you would uh, probably question my professional uh, ability if you'd seen me earlier sitting here in my pajamas. I had to change clothes <laughs> when I saw this camera. <laughs> oh, Roy, that just changes my whole sense of your fashion. <laughs> if you've ever uh, seen Mr. Dale in person, you'd appreciate how significant a change that is. Anyway, I think that, you know, I think that that probably answers my questions. I just want to again emphasize that, you know, this, this property, it does have, it has a long history. It's had good and it's had bad. Um, and I think I know the council member knows that. I know she's doing a fabulous job. And, uh, but I think that just based upon uh, goodwill, you know, when you do come back, that it would be nice if you would just have a meeting out here just to discuss stormwater issues. I don't think it's gonna be controversial at all. I think that you're gonna be doing a lot of really great things here. At least that's what I hear and that's what I feel. And, uh, and I just think it would be a good gesture to this community. And so that's the only questions I have for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Any other committee member want to ask a question? I'm going to reserve mine to the end. Ms. Maddox, you recognize. Um, can you just clarify what exactly you're requesting as part of the variance? What, what is existing on the site now? What's new? Um, I can't tell if the fields are existing and you're improving them or if you're constructing a new field. Um, just maybe give a quick summary of what exactly you're doing. Yes, um, and I apologize. I think uh, 
you know, uh, these documents were, and, and there were documents within your packet where we tried to outline that. We know it's confusing, which was the attempt at the, that presentation, but um, I, I think it's easiest to go back to our presentation. I mean, you can see here, but there are, ex if this field currently does not have a variance to permit mowing or to allow, you know, in the conservation easement with parks, if it were there, it allows people to move through there, but we are requesting, this is a new variance, uh, at least for the field on the left, the larger area to mow and host events there on occasion. That is new, but it's, a, it's an amendment to the existing as we move to the south on the next sheet. All of these areas are existing variances in, in every case, larger areas than what are indicated that allow us to have an unlimited number of events and an unlimited number of parking uh, in terms of how often we can do it up to as many cars as we can fit within these areas with a, it, according to the stormwater management plan. So it's an amendment here, but this variance already exists. We are reducing the area in these areas. And then the last field was a field that has been in question over the years. And one of the things that we're trying to clean up because it is zoned agriculture, um, the state, um, as long as it maintains agricultural use, which it has, um, then it can, uh, it, it could be utilized in a number of ways. The stormwater ordinance doesn't go into place, and I'm paraphrasing, but that's the position that the previous owners had taken. Stormwater had taken the position, no, a greenway has been installed on the property, therefore it's developed, therefore the stormwater uh, ordinance goes into place. However, on occasion, this field was mowed and used for parking for large events. This is an attempt to formalize that and limit how many times a year that can happen and, and to formalize that piece. It's not a part of the SP, um, but it would be included as part of the variance. So this is a, a new portion as well, basically an extension of the existing amendment with additional restrictions. Does Mr. that help? Does that, uh, it, 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 does that answer your question, Ms. Maddox? And I've, I've got a suggestion along this line, if it does or if it doesn't. Yeah, that, that helps. Um, and then also, I see on your request, you're requesting uncompensated fill. Where is that? So what if, if you go back to, I don't know, Rebecca, are you steering at this point? Um, but if you yeah. see it. To the second or third slide, there's a comparison. That is an existing variance. So as, as Mr. Dale mentioned, the property does have a long history. I do wanna clarify, we have been involved with this project for more than 10 years as consultants. We are not developers. We are planners and landscape architects and urban designers. We are not the developers. We do not pay for anything. We do not make the improvements. We design and consult. Um, I think one of the wasn't one of the residents may have stated a fact that that seemed a little confusing, but we have been involved from the beginning. One of the things that happened with that excess fill in the floodplain is at one point the previous owners granted land to Southern Southern Living House to build a home. Once they granted that land, they lost control of the construction, other than some oversight on what it looked like. The builders that built that Southern living home did not build it per plans. And the result of that was uncompensated fill. So that is a previous variance that was granted and had been mitigated. The Fontenelle properties did mitigate it. Um, so that's why it's still on there. We're not proposing anything to try to fix that or go back and fix that from you know seven or eight years ago. Okay, thank you. I, I actually remember that variance coming before our committee as well. Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Haas, I, uh, 
not seeing any other, any other hands raised. So I'm just Don Galbraith, Chairman of the Committee. I'm going to ask you a few questions and make some suggestions and may need the help of, of the owner uh, to come back online and, and, and give us some feedback. But uh, I um, really appreciate Mr. Dale's and Ms. Maddox's engineering insights and questions. Uh, I, I too remember this site. Um, I think Mr. Dale and I probably remember this all the way back to uh, uh, when we were first meeting at the old uh, Metro Water Services headquarters uh, in the tiny conference room out there when these issues first came up. And there always seemed to be an issue of management with uh, uh, following through on commitments made, uh, on collaborating uh, efficiently and effectively with stormwater staff. Uh, there just always seemed to be a lot of miscommunication. So I, I, I agree with Mr. Dale. I, I think it's always a good thing when um, new management arrives, is engaged and is, um, and is trying to bring a, an attitude of, of new clarity and new efficiency, which consolidating these variances, I think effectively does. Um, my, my concern about with your request here is that there's a significant number of members of the community as um, somewhat referenced by Mr. Dale's comments that they just don't feel like they understand what's going on. It sounds like um, just because of a lack of clarity and maybe a, a lack of a clear kind of concise way of comparing and contrasting what was approved before, what's been completed, what's being approved that's new, and what's going to be better. It's going to make a huge difference in everybody's understanding. And so, you know, we can go about this two ways. Um, uh, and this will be up to the entire committee uh, to, to vote on this. But, you know, today, if we had kind of a matrix in front of us of all of these uh, prior variances, where they stand. Uh, for example, you know, the uncompensated fill is really not, not even an issue since it was resolved and it's mitigated. And it's kind of confusing that it's even being brought up. So, you know, if, if we could just focus on a little more clearly, uh, if, if we approve the preliminary proposal today, you know, I'm gonna strongly encourage you to come back next time with just a simple matrix of what was approved in prior variances that was not completed and and in a second column how you're going to change that and specifically how you're going to make it better because if you're making anything worse uh, in terms of as mr dale i think very appropriately said um, will be the focus of public concern that stormwater runoff uh, and water quality impacts, you know, that, that that's a real concern. It sounds like you're trying to make everything better to me. I, I think that's a fair overview. Um, with the exception of unlimited events and unlimited parking, um, um, if I understood you correctly. And uh, on that point, I think it's fair to say that, you know, you know pastures are not great spongy areas to soak up stormwater, that's why forests tend to be preferred for that kind of thing. That's why riparian forests are preferred as kind of a last line of defense for a stream to kind of hold the banks in place to shade the water, to improve the water quality, to add food to the stream for aquatic life, and um, and, to be, and to provide a little bit of a sponge effect. Uh, those roots grow in the water table, they evapotranspirate water right in the atmosphere. Um, but when you have pastures that are moderately, if not barely spongy, they're gonna get even less spongy as you drive cars in and out over them through multiple events. And particularly on days when those fields are wet and those, those tires and those heavy vehicles are compressing those pore spaces in the soil further together, which uh, prevents those pastures from soaking up the normal amount of water that they would have infiltrated, which means there's gonna be more runoff going downstream. So, uh, and more stormwater going off on people offsite, downstream of your site, cumulatively uh, picking up with each of those collective fields uh, on days when you, you do have events that fill all of them up. 
So, um, so um, let me see if I can summarize it by saying this. Um, um, do you all feel like you have to have a preliminary approval today because of the timing of what you're trying to do? Could you consider a deferral to go back and interact with the community and to come back to us with a clearer view of what you're asking for that's new? Uh, and if you can't do that, would you be willing to make sure that you address um, Mr. Dale's request that you have at least one public meeting to explain this to the public and do it well so that we have fewer complaints about this next time and then bring us a, a much more concise understanding of what it is you're changing. Are you still there, Mr. Haas? I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, uh, yeah, this is John. Um, uh, I will, I'll, I'll speak for uh, ownership, my client, um, Mr. Farrell, and, uh, but I'll obviously defer to Councilwoman Gamble in terms of uh, community meetings. I will say that over the course of 10 years, we've had uh, multiple community meetings. I'm on a first name basis with many of the callers today, as well as several others in the community. We have no qualms about meeting with them. Uh, I can um, I cannot assure you that it will reduce uh, the comments, um, but we will absolutely meet with them, explain this to them in another way. Uh, I'm not sure if all the committee members saw uh, the matrix that was provided within our original submittal, but there is there are some documents within the original submittal which do exactly what you described, Mr. Galbraith. Um, in terms of comparison. Can we put that on the screen now? And it, it really needs to be one document, not multiple documents. Well, it's because like it's one, in one in, table. Well, we, we can do that. It, it, what we tried okay. to do was associate the table with the area of the site, but we can, we yeah. can simplify that. I, I would say that we would prefer to, um, you know, I think we've, we've heard your feedback We've gotten your feedback. We've also spoken with parks separately, and we will obviously reach out to stormwater staff um, to address their comments. Uh, we would prefer to get um, action to move forward with a condition that we have a community meeting and uh, and address some of the concerns that have been brought up today. We feel like that's um, very doable. Uh, and And again, we go back to, we feel very strongly that we're making improvements to existing variances here. And it's difficult to make that clear and understandable because of the size and nature of some of these, but uh, we can do a better job at that. Okay, thank you, sir. I think that clarifies a lot. So in, in summary, um, you're, you'd prefer to have a decision day on the preliminary pr approval so you can move forward and that you'd like to have some conditions and would give you better guidance for coming back uh, more successfully with the community and, and with some of the uh, technical issues that, uh, that have kind of plagued the site for several years. All right, so um, um, Mr. Mishu had, had asked to speak some time ago and Ms. Gamble, and then I'll go to Mr. Dale. So Mr. Mishu, you recognize. Okay, thank you, sir. I, I wouldn't mind deferring to uh, Ms. Gamble if she wants to speak first. Um, okay. All right, Ms. Gamble, uh, if, let's just go ahead and run with that. If you'd introduce yourself, Ms. Gamble, so we know who you are and your role. Yes, thank you. I am Jennifer Gamble, uh, Councilwoman for District 3, where this property uh, that's being discussed is located. And I just wanted to uh, concur with, with the committee's uh, assessment that another uh, community meeting is needed. Uh, I welcome that. Uh, I would be happy to, to, uh, to work with the um, owner and and the principal to to coordinate that i just also want to say that at our uh, previous community meetings uh, regarding the sp that talked about uh flooding and stormwater and traffic and noise we had over 100 uh, uh residents attend those meetings so uh, my meetings have been well attended in the community uh, and so there's a, a majority of the community uh, are, are um 
are um, satisfied and and uh, uh, pleased with the communication uh, that has been had with the uh, owner with the with the new plan, and uh, so we I look forward to to having a, a lot of community engagement uh, once we have a community meeting about this specific uh, stormwater variance. Thank you, Council. Appreciate that very much. All right, so I'm gonna go to Mr. Dale and then Ms. Stokes. Mr. Dale, you're recognized. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I wanted to make sure that council member had an opportunity to speak. I saw her hand up and I didn't know whether she'd be recognized. So that was uh, my main reason to, to raise my hand. But uh, also, um, I don't know, I think that, I don't, I don't have a problem grant, uh, granting a preliminary variance here because I think that what they're proposing to do, uh, I think we would all agree that's probably a, a good thing. Uh, I do agree with the chairman that when you do come back, try to simplify this. Don't be requesting variances that are no longer relevant. Uh, with that complexity, I think it just confuses, you know, people within the community. And so um, I'd like to hear from uh, fellow chair member Stokes, and then I may come back to make a recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, and again, I apologize for not seeing hands. I'm I'm taking notes and juggling, and I forget to scroll sometimes to see people have got their hand raised. So, Ms. Stokes, you recognize. Yes, thanks. Um, and I'm uh, just a couple of questions, and I apologize if I missed it. I'm not as familiar um, with this site. So, my understanding, though, certainly in past, there was an event, whether it be a concert or a fair or whatever, and people came in and they parked for you know a few hours. Now we're talking about bungalows, and I think maybe one of the residents said people parking their cars and then they're being taken out with golf carts. So are we just thinking about the duration of the parked cars? Are we now saying there could be cars parked there for days versus previously hours? Mr. Hoff? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. This is not the case at all. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's the, what I was like, what? No, we are not asking to change that. Um, you're absolutely right about these events, and some of those are large events, some of those are weddings, um, some of them are fun runs, some of them are community pumpkin fest. Um, people park for several hours and then they leave. Um, once they leave, according to the stormwater management plan, the field is inspected for any damage, and immediately if there is any damage, it's roped off, identified, and addressed uh, within 48 hours. Um, the In regards to the parking of the bungalows, the bungalows themselves, with the exception of those four units that are in that stream buffer, and, and I will bring photos of that to the next meeting so it's, it's a little more clear. Um, with the exception of those four units, none of the bungalows, the placement of those bungalows are requesting any type of variance. Uh, the, the parking for the bungalows will actually be up front near the check-in building. They Vehicles, uh, personal autos are not permitted across the bridge on White's Creek. So they will either be shuttled to their bungalows or there will be a limited number of golf carts that are available for an additional fee to take up. But yeah, you can see on this graphic, there's a hundred plus spaces right there. Oh, they will come to the check-in, valet their car. And if they're staying for two days, ideally they wouldn't see their car for two days. Or if they're staying for a week, they don't. there's no reason for them to get to their car. Okay, thank you. I'm just not quite as familiar with the property. Um, and then I guess related to that, you have um, offered, and I think it would be helpful if you would bring photos of, I think kind of my biggest maybe sticking point um, of the presentation, and I appreciate you were making some improvements, but would be those, um, the addition of those four bungalows, and you've indicated it's previously disturbed, um, but it would be helpful to see um, kind of what the state of that is, and then it just kind of speaks to them. Then I would kind of just ask, well, what's the hardship? You know, why would we um, grant that variance? So I think additional information on that would be helpful to the committee. Um, and, and yes, if I can address the, the you know, the hardship again at, at one point. Mr. In, Haas. Um, yes. uh, okay. 
if, if, if you don't mind, I, I think you addressed the hardship earlier okay. in the context of, of, of um, fire codes. And um, it, it may be appropriate to interject at this point that I, I, I wanna ask you to consult with stormwater staff about the only type of hardship that we're really allowed to consider in this process. And that has to do with the unique attributes of the property that are were not anticipated by the passing of this regulation concerning uh, buffers. So economic hardships, uh, regulatory hardships, uh, design hardships, those are not really within our realm of jurisdictional uh, capacity to consider. And so the, the physical topography, the, the site characteristics are, are, are what represents a hardship in this case. So, uh, so if you'll go back and revisit that before you come back to us next time, that, I think that'll help clarify this a lot. Absolutely. All right, thank you, sir. Ms. Stokes, um, was there anything else you wanted to ask in that regard? No, I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, sorry to, sorry to interrupt you there, Mr. Haas, but I, I know you'd already addressed it and we, uh, uh, and, and there's some aspects of that that I don't think you'll be able to address completely until you have a chance to interact with stormwater staff about, about how that needs to be addressed from a jurisdictional, jurisdictional perspective. All right, so Mr. Mishu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So- uh, You've been patient. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, so we are not w without some blame over here. I think we made a, a slight mistake and that we had promised uh, some of the people who had emailed that we would read. Um, if they were to submit by a certain date, we would read them out loud. And we did not do so, and the public comment is now closed. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention to see if you wanted to potentially open it up to, to read the comments or whether you are confident that everybody maybe have read all the comments uh, prior to the meeting. Um, but I just want to bring it to your attention that we, uh, I think we may have told somebody if they would submit by the 30th, we would read it out loud. Okay, Mr. Michu, let me take the pulse of the full committee on that since that was your promise and not ours, uh, your uh, the staff's promise and not ours, but uh, unless there's some kind of legal requirement that supersedes uh, the committee's preference. So while uh, Ms. Costonis is uh, thinking about that, I'm gonna turn to Mr. Hunt uh, for and recognize him and then I'll come to you, Mr. Dale. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. All right, just a quick point of reference as it relates generally to this case. Uh, I am Michael Hunt, I'm manager of the group that will generally oversee the grading permit for this work and then later oversee any compliance with conditions relating to the variance. There's been some mention of the site past stormwater management plan and I would just note generally variances can in any conditions associated with them can be handled and assured via the approved grading permit plan. On sites like this, where there is some operational component to the variance, such as frequency of events, uh, numbers of parking, things like that, uh, staff need some official document to reference as they assess that over time. So I would just uh, ask the committee to uh, consider uh, that if this stormwater uh, management plan is going to be uh, a continued factor in this site as part of any granted future variance, that it be included in the entire record for the final submittal such that staff can approve it beforehand and that when and if a variance is approved, it would be part of the official record and something staff could base future compliance inspections off of. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask the uh, all the committee members to consider that uh, and to the person who makes the motion in this regard. All right, uh, Mr. Dale, did I lose you? Uh, was that a errant hand raise? Do you want to be recognized? No, I was going to make a motion, but I guess I'm going to wait to see what legal says about um, whether or not we want to read these other documents. Okay. Um, I know thanks, I guess. Thanks, sir. Yeah. All right, Ms. Costones. 
Sure, thank you for recognizing me, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, so I don't know that I have a really definitive answer for you in this situation. These electronic meetings that we're doing pursuant to the governor's executive order are a little new and different to all of us, um, even though it's been extended a couple of times and we're gaining more experience as they go on. Um, so the, the question is when, when we allow public comment, um, uh, you know, kind of what are our obligations with that? Um, and as far as the Open Meetings Act is concerned, the Open Meetings Act doesn't actually require public comment at all. It just really requires public access to the meeting, the deliberations and the voting. Um, the, the ability to observe it as it's happening, I guess. Um, but we, we have traditionally allowed public comment um, in the stormwater context. And um, certainly when we have, um, Meetings in person, um, we do sometimes also solicit emails um, and, and, and comments in, in that context as well. And um, uh, those meetings um, in the past, um, we have, um, when we've received multiple, multiple email letters, um, uh, listed them or noted the number of them for and against rather than um, reading them out loud. Um, in this context, though, where we have electronic participation only, it is a little different. And the agenda did state that people who submitted their comments by April 30th, I'm sorry, by June 30th, would be allowed to um, uh, have them read out loud during the meeting. Um, you know, I mean, I can see why people might be upset because, and I think this was not done intentionally in any way, but I think that the emails were referred to after the phone call period maybe had concluded. So it might've been someone who submitted a, a, a significant email um, comment and was you know, kind of waiting to hear it read out loud. And, and then um, maybe if they had known that wasn't gonna happen, they would have called in and made a, um, a comment by phone. Um, but chose not to because they thought they'd already covered it in their email and that that was going to be read into the record. Um, so, so I can see someone being unhappy under those circumstances. Again, I'm not sure it's absolutely a requirement of the Open Meetings Act. Um, it is consistent with our practice to, to allow public comment um, and under the circumstances where public comment may only be submitted virtually or electronically, even though we give the callers um, and the, the participants multiple different ways to submit that information in an effort to be um, as transparent as possible and, and as um, accessible as possible. Um, in, in this particular case, what we said in the agenda and, and what we did in practice did, did deviate. Um, so I think that's just something we might need to be more careful about in future. Uh, Another thing that makes it difficult is that with the callers who call in, we're very clear with them that they have two minutes to make their presentation. Um, with the emails, if people submit very, very lengthy emails, um, they might submit something that's going to take more than two minutes to read out loud. So that might be something we think about in future going forward to like notifying people that, yes, we'll read your comments out loud if they're submitted by a certain date, but, um, but not if they're, you know, going to take more than two minutes to read into the record or something along those lines. Um, so, um, you know, I, I haven't given you um, a definitive answer here. Um, I will a little bit defer to the committee's discretion. I don't think any decision you make is going to be absolute violation of the law or, or render this, this meeting invalid or your decision on it invalid. Um, I, I mean, this is a preliminary um, to begin with, so, so that is different um, than, than an, a, a full approval. Um, so just kind of throwing a number of considerations out there for you to consider as you make your decision. All right, Ms. Costonis, one clarification. Is, is there a requirement in our meeting uh, regulations, procedural regulations that says that we are supposed to read emails in these openly in these meetings? As far as I know, there's no rule of procedure that addresses that issue. Because That's my understanding because I reviewed it again this mm -hmm. morning in the new version and didn't see it. Okay, so, um, okay, so I, 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 thank you, Ms. Costonis. I appreciate that very much. Um, just, just a point of note, um, 
after we closed the public hearing, uh, I did go back and ask for, after being reminded uh, that uh, we did have folks who had submitted emails, we, we tallied that we had, I think, nine uh, emails that were against the project. Uh, I think it is fair to say that there may be folks who wished, who would have wished to have stated their perspective openly uh, if they had expected their email to be read out loud. I also think that um, um, that we do have a two minute rule concern and an efficiency. We've been on this case for almost, uh, for, for exactly two hours now at least. Um, uh, uh, what, what is the will of the committee at this point? Mr. Dale, is, is your hand raised in that regard? It is raised in that regard. So. So we have nine emails, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, how many people do we have to speak? Uh, three and or how four? many how many came in before the 30th, Steve? I'm going to defer to Ms. Penny or Logan. They they have the emails and they probably speak a little bit better than I can on that. Yeah. And I apologize, I didn't know this was on the I missed that on the agenda that that was on there. So I, I, I'm going to ask staff not to include anything on the agenda in the future that's not explicitly required by our meeting procedures uh, until the committee has a chance to weigh in on, on that. So in the future, please refrain from making commitments in the publicly posted meeting agendas until we have a chance to make sure that's part of our procedure. But since we're, we're, we have this potential obligation Ms. Gilbert, can you tell us how many people submitted emails before the 30th? They were all submitted either before or on the 30th. Okay. And of emails, how many people in that group have has already spoken before this committee today? Great point. Um, I believe everyone that spoke sent in an email as well. Right, okay, so, so how many emails that reduce? Did that leave six? That's about right, yes. So um, what's the will of the committee? You all want to hear from the emails? I, I just think, Don, that if this was a, a good faith commitment, I, I have a problem if we don't allow this. I know, it, I know we've been it's, talking about this a long time, but I'm uncomfortable not and to speak. If, we, if there's anything over two minutes, we can just stop talking after two minutes. I, I think that's I think that's a great compromise, Mr. Dale. And I yeah. and I, and I do uh, I just want to make sure that the full committee uh, yeah uh, wants to honor that obligation. And uh, so please uh, please proceed, Miss Gilbert. And we'll I'll I'll start the Rebecca and I will start the two minute clock collaboratively with each email. Uh, um, so if you'd like to start with the ones that, that uh, were submitted by people who uh, had not spoken live, please do so. I believe uh, Mr. Bowman has those emails up for you. Um, and just for my clarification, do we have the individual names that called in to speak so I can not read those emails? I know there were three that called in. Uh, it was, I'm sorry, this is John, but it was Gladys Heron, Sarah Bellows, and Elise Hudson. Okay, so I think we have seven emails things. I don't see one of those names on this list. But all right, all right, I'll proceed, uh, Mr. Bowman. We appreciate it. All right, I'll go ahead and start. The first uh, email is from Angela Williams. She lives at... Um, 7203 Old Hickory Boulevard, White Street, Tennessee. Dear Stormwater Committee, I am writing to you today about the Fontenelle mail proposals before you and ask you to clarify and carefully consider the context of these requests in the White Creek area. The new owners of the new project proposed need to adhere to current best practices and do their part to make the community more safe from flooding. Some of the five different variance requests were made prior to the flood of 2010 and then 2013. There have been seven incidents of flash flooding that surpassed the 100-year mark since 2010. Intrusions into the floodplain or floodway 
are immediate danger to neighbors and structures both up and downstream. The floodplain and floodway have been expanded by the U.S. Army Corps in 2017 due to changing topography and repeated flooding. Additional paved and compacted surfaces promote faster runoff and more flooding. Additional rooftops on the steep slopes of the hollow will result in faster runoff, flooding, and landslides. Bridges are a large contributor to flooding. Please update the bridges on the property so they do not catch debris and act like a dam creating unnecessary flooding. Golf carts and special events compacting soil are not safe in the floodplain for visitors with flash flooding. As a lifelong resident of White's Creek, we have seen unprecedented flooding in the past 10 years with noted shifting of alluvial soil in once flat areas. The other change we have seen is the microburst, which causes White's Creek to flash flood major state highways of Old Hickory Boulevard and White's Creek Pike in a matter of 15 minutes. These storms have caused numerous floods, landslides, and shifting land configurations. White's Creek meanders through the 170 acres of Fontenelle, which lies just downstream from the confluence of Earthman's Creek and Little Creek, two major tributaries to White's Creek, before heading down towards West Hamilton Road in Bordeaux. The mansion sits at the end of Hood's Hollow between two hills with steep slopes on both sides with a spring-fed creek running to the mouth of the hollow into White's Creek. The night road side of the property near Earthman's Creek is within 500 yards of a major landslide into White's Creek that happened in 2010. Fontenelle property is within one mile of the 2019 landslide that closed that 24 for months. The slopes in this area are steep and unstable. There are four bridges on or adjacent to Fontenelle property, Knight Road, bridge to the mansion, pedestrian bridge for the Greenway, and the bridge at White's Creek Pike. The bridge to the mansion and the pedestrian bridge become dams to debris very quickly. Mr. Bowman? Yes, sir. I think we're, I think we're at our two minutes. Two minutes. All right. And um, uh, Ms. Gilbert, can you confirm that everybody received a copy of that email, everybody mm -hmm. on the committee? Ms. Gilbert? Many of the emails that were sent, um, the homeowners copied all the members on the emails as well. So okay. I didn't so I'll, I'll, double I'll make sure. to you. Okay, so I'll, I'll make sure we collect all those and redistribute them to every committee member before um, the next hearing. Uh, okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right, proceed, Mr. Bowman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Right. The second email is from um, Barbara Smith at 228 Solness Avenue. The White's Creek runs about 70 feet behind my and several homes in the subdivision. We did not get flooded during the 2010 flood, but I have seen water rising in our backyards in the last few months. Someone built a dam sending any water toward our houses rather than it going in the direction of White's Creek Highway or going on its own anywhere except towards us. We do not need any more changes that might send flood water to our homes. We've been trying to find out who authorized the building of the dam behind our homes. That should be city property, but so far, no city officials seem to know anything about all that building that went on for weeks. We ask that you not allow any work that will put our and other communities in uh, any further danger of being flooded out at the next flood. Sincerely, Barbara Smith, 228 Solness Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Uh, that's <clears throat> we're ready for number three. All right. This is from Christopher Seifer at, let me find his address, uh, 4007 White's Creek Pike. He included some pictures at the beginning of the email. And he says, this email is for the Metro Stormwater Committee. My name is Chris Seifert and I currently own and live at 4007. White's Creek Pike. Since 2018, the eastern half of our property floodplain has flooded several times, three or four times, I believe. In February 2019, the floodwaters came within 10 to 15 feet of our, our home. The previous owners said the water never came up that high for them, so the issue of flooding appears to be worsening. I have attached a few photos we have taken in our time here to illustrate the severity of flooding adjacent to our home. I would like to be kept informed regarding the changes proposed with Fontenelle and how they could impact downstream flooding uh, at my house. If these 
changes have the potential to worsen the severity of the flooding to my home and property. I definitely oppose any such changes. I would like to attend the variance meeting on Thursday to ask questions to gauge how this construction could affect my home, my and my family's safety, and the value of my property. Thank you, Chris Seifer. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. We're ready for the next one. All right. This is from um, George Ewing at 4601 White Creek Pike. Committee members, stormwater staff, and council members, thank you for your time and for the work you do in protecting Nashville. I am not an engineer nor a meteorologist. Still, I would like to impress these points. The variances are many and mostly condensed here represent allowances to disturb zone one to widen a driveway, disturb one, zone one to install utilities, disturb zone one to repair and replace the existing retaining walls, disturb zone one to replace the existing VIP cabanas with permanent bungalow units, disturb zone one to remove existing pedestrian bridge, replace it with a traffic rated bridge upstream of the existing crossing, disturb zone one to construct a drive access for emergency vehicles and cart access, Disturb Zone 2 floodway and buffers for private water line. Disturb Zone 2 floodway and buffers for parking, maintenance, and mowing. Retain a gravel drive across the buffer. Waive stormwater treatment measures. Increase capacity of a bridge from pedestrian to traffic rated. In addition to the above allowances, a balance of 2,312.4 cubic yards of uncompensated fill, enough to fill over 100 large dump trucks, is to remain added. 2,366.4 cubic yards for the Southern Living House, added 533 cubic yards for a gravel parking area. The one item that appears in service of stormwater protection is the subtracting of 587 cubic yards of gravel to remove the gravel parking area. In the past three years, more than 40% of flood claims have been for properties that are unmapped by FEMA or outside FEMA's 1% annual risk zones. Some FEMA maps have been updated, but the relevant U.S. Army Corps study of White Creek is currently suspended awaiting funding. Despite the update to some FEMA maps, a study released yesterday shows that 10% of Davidson County properties have at least 1% annual flood risk, compared with about 3% on the FEMA maps. Despite our reliance upon them. Yes. We're at two minutes. Two minutes. Sorry. All right. Um, Again, I'll ask all the committee members to refer to these uh, emails. I, I read them all before I came. Very helpful right, comments. Next. Thank you, Mr. Next Bowman. one is from uh, Lindsay Seifert at 4007 White Creek Pike. Um, hi, I wanted to reach out about my concerns with the stormwater appeal for the font now that is occurring July 2nd, 2020. I'm not certain what all the variances or appeals truly are, but I did want you to know that as a property owner directly across the creek from the Fontenelle, Lindsay Seaford at 4007 White Creek Pike, I have watched the creek flood water rise higher and higher in the past two years. Last year, after a large storm, the flood water came about a foot from flooding my home. My home is a little over half an acre from the creek and raised about 20 feet above the floodplain. I worry that any changes made to the current layout will result in the potential flooding in my home. I am happy to send pictures of the typical flooding that occurs after a few days of rain as well as how close it got to my home last year. Please let me know if there's anything I can provide you with. Thank you, Lindsay C. for 4007 White Creek Pike. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. All right, next one is yeah, we'll Nina Fort Meyer. Okay, thank you, sir. 5267 Simpkins Road. I'm writing regarding the Fontenelle stormwater variance request. Water will always flow somewhere. If you slow it down to protect the flood foam property, you flood the people upstream. If you redirect the flow, you flood somebody else. Harden the surface and the quick runoff floods the people downstream. While I don't live in this particular flood path, I've been in this position before. We built a house responsibly and a developer built in a floodplain and negated that. This is no different. Fontenelle should not flood its neighbors. Thank you, Nina Fortmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Does that conclude them? Uh, there's there's one more. Okay. And that is from um, Zachary Dyer at 681 Brick Church Lane. Thank you in advance for your time and service. I know what a commitment it can be. I am writing to ask you 
uh, reject the variance Fontenelle have requested to ignore previous and current stormwater conditions. Not only is it a selfish thing that would negatively impact flood neighbors up and downstream, it would actually have the most negative impact on Fontenelle. Please save them from themselves and reject this request. Thank you. Zach Dyer, 681 Brick Church Lane, White's Creek, Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Okay. All right. We, we've heard some excellent uh, feedback from the public, um, some very uh, informed understanding of uh, stormwater dynamics and flooding and hydrogeomorphic characteristics of watersheds, even though some of those words weren't explicitly used. It sounds like they understand uh, the issues that we deal with in this committee each month. So uh, appreciate that input. Uh, so uh, I'd like to now open it up to the committee to uh, for motions concerning um, where we go from here. So if you'll be thinking about a motion, looks like I, I need to turn to uh, Ms. Doan or Ms. Harrison. By chance, do either of you have the same perspective? I'll let Ms. Harrison speak first. Okay. Um, thank, you. thank you, yes. Um, this is Cindy Harrison. I'm the Greenways and Open Space Director for Metro Parks. Thank you, and Ms. Harrison. Thank you. Um, just quickly, in reference to the comments that I made on behalf of the division, will those be addressed at, you know, I'm trying to understand how those will be addressed without taking up a whole lot of time for the committee. And I- Can you, re can you restate your comments? Um, yes, I'll try to go really quickly. We request the boundaries of the existing Greenways conservation easement to be clearly shown on the applicant's exhibits for the variance request. We request a more detailed description of the need for the amount and extent of proposed event space and parking. And I guess a little bit of that has already been answered. Um, staff requests that the parking and event space be downsized. The amount of area requested for parking conflicts with the conservation intent of the Greenways conservation easement and that um, especially affects the Southern parcel um, the current easement restricts, the current easements that are in place, greenway easements, restrict the vehicular travel to a designated shear use segment of trail. Staff requests a detailed plan indicating traffic flow and traffic control measures for the current shared use portion of the trail and to designate any proposed shear use segment on the new trail to the north. So that's a, a safety concern and an operational concern for, for the Greenway. Um, and I have talked with the engineers and I think we're, we're moving in that direction of trying to come to a solution, but ultimately we want to make sure that the Greenway is open from one end of the property to the other, to the public without a ticketed, without a ticket. Um, and I understand that because we have loops in the Greenway that that path could change uh, depending on how those events are coordinated, but we'd like a little more information about how that can operate. Uh, and the last was staff request that the applicant coordinate to locate and provide a Greenway conservation, conservation easement on that northern portion. And I, I, we can talk about that. It's operational and public safety. And I also want to make sure that the Greenway is included in the discussion with the community at the next public meeting to understand that these variance requests, while they deal with stormwater, do have a big implication on the Greenways and the Greenways conservation easement. And I just don't want that to get lost. Ms. Harrison, is it fair to say that uh, some of these concerns are based on the fact that this greenway is an unpaved path in, in that easement and it, it, perhaps it's mowed and it's a little bit harder to keep people from parking on top of it? Well, no, our our greenway is paved. Um, the, in the, it's okay. The, the trails going up the hill to the mansion are, are unpaved. Um, okay. My concern is down on the paved. And also, okay. we have a list on here, but just out of the conversation today, the construction of those bungalows are we expecting construction traffic to impede use of the Greenway? 
right, Mr. Haas, do you want to address any of those uh, comments? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I have spoken with uh, Ms. Harrison um, in regards to this, and as well as the owner, Mr. Farrell. We met with her several months ago to discuss this. One thing that I think is imperative that it is mentioned that the three fields or, or you know, the four fields that are on the plan you know, in front of your screen right now um, with that greenway, as well as the field to the south, I think it's field E, we have, we have it labeled, are all a part of an existing agreement with parks. There is a signed agreement that was signed off on by Metro Council and Mayor Dean for both of those. We're not proposing any changes to those. I think what we've talked about with um, Ms. Harrison is that there are some concerns they have, much like Stormwater has, has indicated that they want to clarify some things. And we're very much willing to do that, do that and work with them. And we think that it is a, a clear goal uh, of our client, of our community, of the council person and Councilwoman Gamble, that we do want a greenway from one end to the other. Um, we need to make sure we all understand the terms that, that go with that. So we'll absolutely continue to work with parks on that. And I think we're very close to getting something that everybody can agree on. Okay. All right, Mr. Haas, um, are you willing to uh, integrate the uh, aspect the aspects of greenways concerns in the public hearings as well that you plan? Uh, certainly, certainly. Okay, all right. All right. Thank you. Ms. Um, Ms. Harrison, does that, does that uh, if, if he's willing to work with you between uh, whatever decision the committee makes today and, and your next request uh, is, and is willing to raise these issues in the public hearing, does that meet your concerns today? Yes, as, as long as we do, are able to get back with the committee and, and, and report on the results of all of that. Um, okay. Yes, that's, thank you. That sounds fair, sounds fair. So I'll ask the committee to consider Ms. Harrison's comments in a potential motion as well. All right, Ms. Doan, you recognized, and then I'll go to Ms. Dale. Thank you. Um, and first I wanna thank Fontenelle for um, putting the variants together like this. We had requested that they just come forth with one single variant so that we won't have, as some committee members alluded to, um, just a, a confusing matrix of, of previous variances. And we, we have brought up the question since the old variances were granted, um, and in certain cases for a use that is no longer happening at the property, whether or not those variances are still valid. So the way we're approaching this now is one unified variance one unified plan um, that, that we can keep on record and for the proposed use. So if you would assess what they're proposing to do on the property now um, and the variances they're asking for that, if that clarifies the approach we're taking. Okay, um, who would you like to respond to that, Ms. Stone, specifically? Um, I I wasn't specifically looking for a response. I just know there were some questions coming from committee members as what were the old variances and what was approved and what's still approved and yeah. can we get a matrix? And we're just kind of approaching this as, as a brand new variance. Okay, okay. So so to, to, to make sure that we have a better understanding on this, assuming that it goes forward, I, I think Mr. Haas has agreed to simplify the new requests in contrast to the old variances to show us what's changed so that we can kind of see what's already been decided, what's going to be different, could, could things be getting better than they were originally proposed, or are they going to potentially create more flooding and runoff and, and lower water quality than what's proposed? Mr. Haas, you still okay with doing that? Yes, absolutely. All right, thanks, sir. All right, Mr. Dale. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Haas, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just wanted to to clarify and maybe reiterate that uh, what, what Rebecca stated is absolutely correct. And a number of these variances, we do not have to amend, um, you know, assuming it, because there, there is some disagreement about whether the use has changed or not. 
Um, but uh, we're here in the interest of working with staff, working with this committee to clean all this up and 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 make it easier for everyone. Yes, sir. And, and I, from what I remember about this process, it's not what's been put in writing that's been problematic. It's been the operational subjectivity and and you know um, unpredictability that's been the biggest headache, which creates effective impacts of written expectations that can't adequately document operational behaviors uh, affecting those written expectations. So it's a, it sure would be nice if you could come up with a new way of doing it since you've been associated with it so long, Mr. Haas. Well, I, I would say, and I think this goes back to staff, we recognize that. And I think in the last maybe two to three years of operations, it might have been in the last year of operations that uh, the previous owners had an event out there and, and it, it really kind of came to a head. It was a multiple day event. And that's when we established the tier one, tier two, tier three form. And, mm -hmm. and I believe that that really, really helped everything. And like I okay. said, we, we have uh, adopted that into our SP. We've also adopted it into negotiations with Piedmont, which has added a 110 foot uh, gas easement through these fields uh, in the meantime. So, okay. so it sounds like then you need to win over your neighbors. Then. Okay. Sure. We'll continue to work with them. All right. Thanks, sir. All right, Mr. Dale, you're recognized. Just making sure you can hear me again. We hear you, hear you great, man. Uh, working on this hybrid computer and phone thing right here. So uh, <laughs> anyway, I want to apologize to the uh, council member, especially to, to hold her so captive for such a long period of time and also to the public for our little glitches. And I want to thank the applicant for all that he's done. I'm going to make a motion that we do approve this preliminarily with uh, conditions. Uh, and those conditions would be that when he comes back with his request to simplify that as one unified request, that uh, that they do conduct another community meeting and in that meeting specifically address stormwater and greenway and water quality concerns and flooding concerns. Uh, when you come back to the committee, I would like for you to quantify, you know, what, what's going on water quality wise, what improvements are you making? Because I think you are making those and we are more or less a water quality board. Uh, to provide images of the bungalows and those other improvements that we had talked about and another committee member had referenced, that you clearly state your hardship, that you also talk about any flooding potential or anything that you've done to improve or uh, mitigate any kind of flooding potential, and that you also add to your request to uh, address the concerns as, a, as a referenced by Greenways. And so th that would be my motion. All right, so we have a motion made by Mr. Dale. Uh, do we have a second? Okay, just because of the technological difficulties, let me state what's at stake here. Okay, there's Ms. Stokes' hand. Ms. Stokes, you're recognized. I second the motion. All right, so we have a motion that's been made by Mr. Dale. That's been properly seconded. Uh, do we have any discussion on the motion from any committee member? Ms. Doan, is your hand raised for a reason? No, I just haven't unraised it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ms. Maddox, I think you raised yours. I can't hear you, Ms. Maddox. Sorry about that. Uh, I think my main hang up is the hardship for the variance. So I think uh, I just like to see a better explanation of that going forward. Mr. Dale, are you willing to integrate that into your, as a friendly amendment into your motion that they address the side hardships jurisdictional? I think that was. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have that on the record that that's 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 part of that motion. Yes, the motion was to simplify the request, unify it, 
conduct a community meeting and at that meeting uh, discuss stormwater, greenways, the greenways wanted that to be discussed as well, water quality, to bring at the next, at our next meeting to bring more images of the improvements that are gonna be made in the disturbed areas around the bungalows, to clearly state their hardship, to uh, discuss any kind of floodway potential and water quality improvements, and to also address greenways concerns. So Ms. Gilbert, would you please explicitly um, record all of that in the minutes as the motion so that we got a good solid record of expectations here. And uh, is there any further discussion on this motion? We'll wait five seconds. All right, seeing none, all those in favor by roll call vote. I'll, I'll call out your name and if you'll indicate uh, whether or not you uh, support the motion or do not support it, uh, we'll record your vote. Ms. Stokes. Yay. All right, Ms. Stokes votes yay, a, a yes. Mr. Dale. Yes. Mr. Dale votes yes. Ms. Maddox. Yes. Ms. Maddox votes yes. Ms. Adams Taylor. Yes. Ms. Adams Taylor votes yes. Dr. Gomez Velez. Oh, yes. Dr. Gomez Velez votes yes. So the preliminary approval with the conditions stated by Mr. Dale are, are hereby uh, unanimously approved. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Haas and team. Um, best wishes. Uh, certainly looks like you all have the chance to add a lot of new sponginess on that side as well with some of what you're proposing. It could greatly uh, affect the flooding. So. Please, uh, please help us help you when you come back, okay? Absolutely, and, and thank you all for your time today and, and your understanding. Uh, we will uh, we'll do our best to satisfy your wishes when we, we, when we come back before you for final. Thanks, sir. Okay. <laughs> all right, um, thank I'm you gonna so guess much. that, thank you, thank you, sir, and thank you, uh, uh, Council Representative Gamble for being patient with us. I, Last in, in May, we had a council representative that stayed with us about, I think, almost as long, if not longer. So you all, uh, you all are very dedicated public servants. We appreciate mm -hmm. it. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your service and, and the opportunity to participate. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Uh, why don't we take a 10 minute break? Is that, is that, anybody have objection to taking a 10 minute break? All right, seeing none, uh, let's come back at uh, 11.02 and, uh, and resume our next two items of business. So Rebecca, if you could just kind of post something on the screen that we're, we're taking a break, that'd be great. of the case. Mr. Bowman, the floor is yours. And I'll remind the public that uh, you can call in at 629-255-1919, 629-255-1919. All right, Mr. Bowman. All right, the second case on the agenda is case number 2020-0008, Nolensville Road Development at 412 Harding Place, APN 1470-300-6700. Inspectors Kenneth Tranter, Council District 26, Courtney Johnston. Applicants request to allow the following. 145 cubic yards of cut below the two-year flood elevation, uh, 354 cubic yards of uncompensated fill. Appellant is NKB LLC, represented by Barry Quinn of Barge Coffin and Associates Incorporated. Comments, stormwater staff request additional buffer signs to help deter trimming of the buffer for sight lines to the Harding Place billboard on the adjacent parcel. Codes had no comment provided. Planning, site is zoned SCR. Refer to Stormwater Variance Committee for review. Greenways, parks refer, defers to the decision of the Stormwater Management Committee. 
Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I mentioned our applicant is uh, present. I would just ask that you introduce yourself first and any other um, participants on your team that uh, need to be recognized in case any committee member uh, needs to ask questions of a particular specialist or the developer or owner or public official involved. And uh, we're gonna give you uh, 10 minutes uh, for your presentation, um, but that will not include your introduction. So if you'd like to start with your introductions. Uh, Don, quickly, um, yes, Barry, this is Rebecca. Do you wanna share your screen or do you want me to put your plans up? Uh, do you have the application that we submitted? I do. That'll be fine then. And if, 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 let me just pause for a second and remind everybody that I've already been notified that uh, uh, one of our committee members, uh, Anna Maddox, is going to need to recuse herself from this uh, case. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Ms. Maddox, as our yeah. vice chair of the committee. Rebecca, right, if you so could maybe just make that full you know, zoom out a little bit potentially. We could probably see it all. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Barry Quinn, Bart's Coffin Associates. Uh, also on the phone is Jeff Hooper from our firm. Um, and I believe I believe that is it for, for our team for this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. So whenever you get ready to get started with your presentation, I'll start the clock. Okay, all right, I'm ready, uh, ready to go now. So, our first, we, we've arranged this attachment A, attachment B that follows the variance application um, with regard to hardships and, and uh, that kind of thing. So this first exhibit, uh, you know, that so the site, the, the parcel that you see there was created in October of last year and uh, lies completely within the 100 year floodplain. The parcel was created in anticipation of um, incorporating a dry flood proof structure. The, the exhibit you see on the screen, the yellow color um, is the part of the site that lies currently below the two year elevation. Um, and therefore this first, the first piece of the presentation here addresses the, the, uh, the request to be able to count the area below the two year elevation. So that stream to the west and, the, uh, and then the portion of the parking lot it's on the east side are all below the two year elevation. The pink area then indicates uh, additional area that we're uh, excavating out that lies below the two year. Um, okay, next slide please, or next page. Um, so this one, this one down at the bottom here um, is, you know, illustrating the situation, there's a an unnamed tributary in the south of the western part of the site. The green area uh, includes the channel and the zone one buffer, uh, which aren't being disturbed. The yellow area then uh, describes the, the uh, zone two buffer that's not being disturbed other than for re replanting and uh, restoration. The blue area is the zone two buffer that is currently paved with asphalt that's proposed to be removed, asphalt removed and, uh, you know, re-landscaped. Um, okay, the next, next page. Uh, at this location, so this is a, obviously the floodplain as it overlays and um, the, the 30, it was back in uh, about five years ago, there was about a 30,000 square foot part of this um, original Kmart on the south end. Rebecca, I don't know if you can point to that orange uh, thing kind of at the south end, uh, that slab. So, of course, you know, looking at this, it looks like that a portion of the site is above the base flood elevation of 507, when in fact it's not. It, the, the slab elevation there is 506.3. So I just want to point that out because there is no part of this particular parcel that is above the current base flood elevation. Okay, next next page, please. This exhibit here shows, uh, again, shows the, the, the buffer, the buffer that's, that's going to be, um, you know, that on the uh, north side is being removed and replanted. 
the lighter shade of green are the two areas that we were able to do comp uh, do cut. So the, the green area to the right is currently paved all the way out to the Harding Place right away. And that section is being removed and uh, and lowered to create some uh, some amount of compensating cut there. The parking lot to the north of that green shaded area um, is part of cross parking agreements and everything with Hardee's and Arby's and all that. So that that kind of has to stay in place. And we're not proposing any any work in that area other than just uh, restriping the parking. In the southwest corner, there's another area over there that um, where we're proposing to cut that down to generate some additional fill but you know just in general there's just not a lot of space to uh, to generate that the the blue area is a uh, proposed level two bioretention pond that will take all of the roof water and uh, parking lot water and everything on the uh, all of the building and, and all of that through the bioretention pond and back out to the to the box culvert okay next uh, let's see. Next, we could go to uh, okay. uh, yeah, back. Uh, if you could go up one, please, Rebecca, one page back up. So here's where we're defining an exceptional hardship. Um, we've got really uh, you know, four different things. First of all, in that southwest corner, you know, about a f between the the stream and all the buffers, that takes up about you know almost a quarter of the of the lot. So we're trying, other than taking out the paving, re-landscaping it, um, and you know the buffers, uh, particularly the the north buffers, is a is a mess. So trying to restore that buffer, but for the most part, we're not trying to we're not cutting any of that down. So that's that's one. The second one is I've already mentioned the asphalt parking that's part of all the cross easements and whatnot. Um, and then the, the the grades along from from Harding Place up to the Habitat building, you know, there's not really any any opportunity to change that grade because we've got to get up the hill such that we then relate to the southern, you know, the southeast corner of the Habitat uh, building. Uh, and then of course we have to we have to flood proof the structure, you know, to one foot above base flood elevation. So uh, next page, please. Uh, one thing, so, you know, as, as one thing we always do is, uh, you know, we always refer to the, okay, what happened in May of 2010 to try to get a, you know, sort of a practical understanding. I mean, we're, we fully understand we've got to comply with the, uh, with the regulatory flood elevation as far as uh, flood proofing and, and so forth. But, you know, there's a pretty clear pattern in May 2010 of an elevation of, uh, 504, which is three feet below the base flood elevation. So, uh, again, we've, we're, we're held to the 507. We understand that, but uh, nevertheless, we, you know, we don't. We believe the actual risk is, is quite a bit lower than that. Within the LID boundary, um, this project proposes to reduce the uh, impervious surface ratio from 91% to 58%, and uh, that corresponds to about an 11 percent reduction in the peak flow rate of stormwater actually generated from the site versus the way it is today. Uh, next page, please. So back to the back to the May 2010. I, I just I wanted to to just illustrate um, the blue. So in the with the proposed plan, in other words, if 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 this project is is approved and May 2010 happened again, that would be the blue indicates what would actually be flooded. So that's elevation 504. Um, next page, please. And then the green, it's the same slide, but then the green area would be area that, you know, flooded in 2010 that would be uh, taken out, you know, would no longer be flooded based on the regrading that's proposed. Uh, next page, please. Uh, that's just a shot of, uh, you know, the, the total floodplain width here at this location is about 1,600 feet. Um, the, the width of the property that we're uh, requesting the variance for is about 200 feet of that. It's well outside the floodway on the other side of Harding Place, 200 feet in width, and it represents about 
three quarters of an inch of depth. So as you can see, compared to the overall cross section of flow uh, at this location, uh, it's uh, it's down you know less than less than 0.2 percent. Um, so next slide. Um, <clears throat> so um, you know we are in our in our volumetric calculations we are uh, we're not including or not taking any credit for either the original building that was there you know many years ago that was taken out because it was not a dry flood proof structure there was still volume there with the walls and all the content but um, but we're not taking any credit for that we've also removed the 42 cubic yards um, of uh, volume that would be taken up by the required or the uh, proposed ponding in the bioretention basin. Uh, let's see, Rebecca, if you could go to, well, you know what, that, there, there's pictures at the very end of this if you want to pull those up or if you have some other thing, but other than that, I'll, uh, uh, that's about all I have other than, uh, other than answering questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Quinn. All right, at this time, we're gonna open up the public hearing portion of our discussion, which will include live call-in comments, public in-person comments if they exist at Sunny West Conference Room, and email comments. So we'll start with the uh, live call-in comments at this moment. I'll remind you, if you're, just, if you're watching this live and you wanna comment, Phone number is posted on the screen currently. Uh, if you're listening in on the phone, uh, it's 629-255-1919. 629-255-1919. Okay, um, Mr. or Madam Operator, do we have anyone in the queue? No, there are not any calls in the queue. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna assume that we're ready to proceed with uh, finding out if there's anybody at the public in-person kiosk at the Sunny West Conference. No, Mr. Chairman, there's nobody here in support or against the project. Thank you, sir. All right, um, Mr. Bowman, do we have any email comments that uh, need to be read at this time? There were no email comments sent in on this case. Okay. All right, all right, seeing none, I'll pause for about 10 seconds uh, just in case someone watching live has decided to call in. There's a chance that we could open up the public hearing again as we did earlier, uh, informally, as such we did, <laughs> or I did, but uh, looks like Probably not going to get anybody to comment on this, which is not unusual. Give about five more seconds. Okay, with that, uh, I'll close the public hearing portion of this proceeding and uh, open it up to uh, the committee members to ask questions of the applicants. Thank you, Mr. Quinn, for that very uh, concise and uh, clear uh, summary. Thank you, sir. Rebecca, did, did you have a comment? You got your hand raised. No, I just have to unshare my screen to unraise my hand. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's a different function than just clicking the hand again, isn't it? Okay. Any committee members uh, uh, willing to venture out? I'll I'll ask a question real quick, um, Mr. Quinn. Um, uh, I, I think your before and after photos associated with flooding and inundation were very telling. Um, are you concerned at all about your bioretention basin being impacted during a flood? I, I noticed the inundation lines, uh, that there's a line of separation between the buffers and the inside of the bioretention basin in your flood photo, which implies that the basin probably would not be overtopped by a flood event. Is that fair to say? 
Yeah, so the, the top of mulch elevation in our proposed uh, bioretention basin is 503.75, so the blue represents 504. So again, in the May 2010 example, there would be three inches of water in the bioretention basin. And maybe more just from collecting runoff. Well, there would be more in a in a in a. In a there would be more in that situation than there would be in a in the backwater flood. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. And I and uh, this is a casual note. I've seen Mr. Quinn's work in other contexts, and this company's work in the bioretention cells. They uh, they look great and function great. So, uh, anyone else? Uh, anyone else on the committee want to venture out a potential uh, comment, observation, question, or motion? These moments always make you wonder if people are really here. <laughs> so, so to, would uh, uh, I'll just remind everybody that in this in my practice is to try to be more of a neutral third party and and a tiebreaker voter. So uh, uh, so this might be a good point for someone to consider making a motion. Mr. Dale. I'm paying attention. <laughs> I know uh, you are. <laughs> I, I just want to. I see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what was all that? <laughs> well, anyway, um, I mean, I, I understand uh, his presentation. I think he did a very, very good job. I really don't have anything to add. So uh, I would make a motion now to approve his request. Uh, as you requested it. So my motion is to right. approve. Mr. Bell's made a motion to approve. This is a prior developed site that's been redeveloped. Our stormwater uh, uh, procedure, variance procedure guidelines do account for this type of variance. Uh, it's not a natural site. Uh, they are improving it. Do we have a second? All right, recognize it. Ms. Ronette Adams-Taylor? I second. All right, motion has been made and properly seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion? I'll give us about 10 second pause to account for technical issues. Mr. Dale, is, is your hand raised because you want to have any other discussion? Seeing none. All right, so let's proceed with the roll call vote. Since I see no discussion, since Ms. Doan's hand being raised is uncontrolled. <laughs> and uh, we'll proceed with uh, Ms. Stokes. Uh, what is your vote, please? Um, in favor. All right, Ms. Stokes votes aye. Mr. Dale? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Dale votes aye as the sponsoring motion. Ms. Maddox is. is uh, um, not participating in this vote, so Ms. Adams Taylor. Aye. Votes aye. Dr. Gomez Velez. Aye. Dr. Gomez Velez votes aye. So we have a unanimous vote. Motion passes. Congratulations, Mr. Quinn. We know you'll execute well. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, so that takes care of our uh, formal business in terms of variances. Uh, we have one last item of business that's not associated with a variance and that has to do with uh, the review of our stormwater management manual, volume one, appendix C edits. We, uh, we briefly discussed this in May. The decision was made that uh, we needed to uh, have a more detailed and open discussion and properly public notice this uh, committee vote. We've done so. 
I uh, hope everyone's had a chance to review it, but I'll just ask uh, Ms. Doan if she would like to hit some of the highlights of the change. Sure, um, the highlights are, are pretty simple. Um, at the suggestion of, of Terry Costonis, we integrated the new rules of procedure that were adopted by the Stormwater Management Committee in 2018 and the uh, procedure for the posting of public notice signs, which was <laughs> adopted way back in uh, 2005. We wanted to have them all in one place and we put them into the appendix of the stormwater management manual volume one that governs the stormwater management committee. All right, is that it? That's it. All right, and it's a real challenge not being able to see someone's face knowing that they're <laughs> done. <laughs> Never know if they've been disconnected. All right, so does anyone have any questions? Any committee members have any questions for staff about the changes that have been made? There was there was also a uh, kind of a track your changes version that had red highlights for additions, and strike throughs for deletions. Um, anything raise a concern or a question at this time? Ms. Costonis, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to ask Rebecca for a clarification. I know in the current stormwater management manual, this is actually Appendix F. Is it going to be C in the new one? That is correct. We um, we renumbered all the appendices based on their appearance in the stormwater management manual. Gotcha. Thanks. So we given this section a technical promotion. Sounds like then in the appendices. All right. Any other questions, Ms. Costones? I still see your hand. All right, thank you. All right. So I'm gonna pause for about 10 seconds, see if anyone has any other discussion. And maybe I'll give someone a few moments to form a motion. If the roll call vote on your screen does not prompt you otherwise. All right, Ms. Stokes. Um, certainly, I've reviewed the changes and I appreciate the effort by staff to incorporate um, some of the revisions that have occurred over the past several years. So I, I make a motion to approve the revised appendix as presented. All right, Ms. Stokes has made a motion to approve the revised appendix as amended. Is there a second? I second. All right, that's uh, Dr. Jesus Gomez Velez. I think, I think I recognize your voice. Yes. Thank you, sir. All right, so motion been made and properly seconded. I'll pause for about five seconds to see if there's any further discussion. Seeing no intentional hands raised, we'll proceed with a roll call vote. Ms. Stokes, may we vote? Yes. Stokes votes yes. Mr. Dale? Yes. Mr. Dale votes yes. Ms. Maddox? Vice Chair? Aye. Ms. Maddox votes yes. Ms. Adams-Taylor? Yes. Ms. Adams-Taylor votes yes. Dr. gomez Velas. Yes. All right, so we have a unanimous vote. Motion passes. Uh, we have a new Stormwater Management Manual Appendix with promotion. All right, so that concludes all of our official business. Um, I've got one uh, quick proposal that I wanna run by the committee that's just a, a brief concern. I realize we're all probably worn down by uh, just, just uh, the events of life and, and a long morning um, and the challenges of working virtually but um, um, I would like to propose that we have a discussion at our next meeting, or at least at, at a meeting where we've got a low uh, volume of variance proposals on the table. And I'll leave that to staff to help sort that out if the entire committee is comfortable with this. But uh, um, 
one trend that I've, I've noticed in the last year is that um, uh, we're, we seem to be doing a really good job at managing zone one interventions for undeveloped sites. And, um, and we seem to be uh, managing uh, appropriate mitigation for prior developed zone one and zone two sites. You may have noticed that we've had a string of various proposals over the last year, small string of prior developed sites. Um, and in some cases, um, uh, we, we asked for very explicit mitigation requirements, particularly for zone ones, uh, either avoiding it completely or, or adding some additional um, uh, sort of L ID oriented kind of mitigation practices. Um, I remember one case presented by um, Mr. Dale's firm that where he recused himself, uh, they had offered to do pervious paving due to a prior developed, very narrow zone one um, a, a stream and, the, and a zone two encroachment with a, a new development. The, the prior development in that case would have been the, the straightening of the stream and the insertion of a road that changed the hydrologic characteristics of the site fairly significantly, very significantly. In other cases, we've had a hotel come back with a, a redevelopment and an expansion and they put in some previous paving as a mitigation practice for some zone one uh, changes, even though it wasn't naturalized, it was still a zone one buffer. Uh, and then we, ha I think we had another case come up. Uh, I know we got another case come up in May where we kind of, we struggled a lot with trying to come up with appropriate mitigation because the applicant just didn't, didn't uh, feel they had the capacity to do more than planting a few trees. And it, it, it just made me realize that we have this historic issue of, um, of not really having some clear guidelines for mitigation that uh, might give applicants a little more certainty and give us a little more certainty so that we don't have to have as quite as much debate and, and get involved in as much detailed prescriptive discussions with uh, with uh, variance condition outcomes if we had a little more of a template to work from that um, that allowed us to uh, to kind of go back to kind of first base each time when we when we receive some of these prior developed sites um, th does anyone else share this concern about needing to have a little less arbitrary mitigation requirements do you, you think it'd be worth having a discussion about some of these prior sites um, where we've had these, uh, where we've come up with a varying types of conditions for permit variances, particularly when involved a zone one, to examine them and, and, and potentially see if there was an opportunity to give applicants a little more, a little clearer guidance as to how they might propose uh, uh, appropriate mitigation for these kind of sites, or am I, am I worrying too much? This is uh, Jesus. I, I I completely second that. I think you know, especially you know, for me being uh, new in the committee, I think uh, uh, that that would be a huge help uh, personally. But but I think I, I agree with you. I think in terms of giving guidance, that uh, that will make things uh, clearer for 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 the applicant. Thank you, Dr. Velas Gomez, and and. Uh... Uh, and I'm also thinking, I'm glad you raised your hand, Mr. Dale, because I remember Mr. Dale having some concerns um, about how we were approaching this in that particular discussion about uh, involving a series of cases of redevelopments in one session. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to speak for you, Mr. Dale. You're recognized. Uh, no, I, I think that obviously you have the highest level of expertise in this area. And if you're concerned, then I would think the rest of us would have to share that and it gives us an opportunity to, to learn more as well, especially some of the new members. So I think that your concern is very well founded and I think it's something we need to talk about. Thank you, sir. All right, so, um, and, I, and I would, I know I mentioned this earlier, uh, one of the considerations that our, our procedures allow us to consider our prior development uh, criteria that meets a certain definition of prior development uh, 
and uh, and so I've got a proposal, and I I might I might step out of this kind of neutral role and just suggest a since this is since this is um, something that I'm uh, suggesting that we do, and if any other committee member would like to weigh in on this, uh, please feel free to jump in. Uh, but my initial proposal is is to move that uh, we ask staff to uh, to do something like what they did with an analysis of um, the zone one sites uh, when we had that big case a few years ago that went to the state appeals court uh, to do something, to do a quick analysis of prior developed sites that involve zone one um, uh, uh, redesigns where um, we came up with conditions to um, uh, uh, get more functional benefit for stormwater benefit, water quality benefit out of the site, uh, such as previous paving, bioretention, um, and other things of that nature, tree plantings, um, realignments of, of, of uh, hydrologic features. It, it just give us a kind of a summary uh, of a, maybe a, um, a uh, statistically uh, um, a statistical sample of some prominent recent cases, maybe some historical cases, just so we can kind of see how we're doing as a committee in one, giving applicants clear expectations on the front end of what they could come in and propose to make our job easier, to have a, a clear understanding of what they think is possible and to give them less ambiguity to work with uh, in, in, in crafting their proposals because that takes more time and money away from the thing that they really are in the business to do and that's to uh, survive as uh, business people and as citizens in their various occupations. But then secondly, uh, to examine um, some of the mitigation practices that we have considered and maybe haven't considered that we could um, utilize uh, either in the um, um, checklist or in um, uh, an amendment to the stormwater guideline regulations like we just did, the stormwater manual, that would give applicants a little clearer idea of how to, how to approach those situations. So, uh, so in summary, my motion is, is to have staff come back to us. Uh, I think Steve Michoud just texted me that we have one case next month, so come back to us next month with uh, kind of a quick overview that would address um, zone one prior developed sites, prior mitigation uh, conditional decisions that we made and then new opportunities to maybe um, consider some new things. So that's my motion. Mr. Yes. Yeah. I think we, I think, you know, Obviously, staff has other things they have to do as well. And so let's ask staff how much of a burden that would be or how much time they need in order to, you know, feel like that they have adequate time to give us the information that you're asking for. All right. Mr. Mishu or Mr. Hunt or Ms. Doan. I'll start out. Uh, the first thing I was thinking of is I'm going to have to go back and listen to what exactly was said so that way I'm – giving you exactly what you want or the, the Metro Water team's giving you what you want. Uh, I don't know if it would be out of place to ask that maybe if you could uh, articulate the request in an email. And uh, we'd be glad to. That'd be great. And then we could uh, make sure that we're, we're going in the right direction to get you what you want. I, I do believe we want to be able to do what, whatever you request and get that for you. That sounds great. And, and it's, it's, um, Mr. Dale's point's well taken. I, you know, I, I could see you doing an analysis of, of decision letters um, and just to see what conditions were explicitly required in the decision letters, but that might not adequately cover it. I, on one end of the spectrum, you've got sort of tape discussions and on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the decision letter. I don't, I don't know if there's something in, in their mitigation plans that might also be part of that, but. I could shortcut this quite a bit by telling you um, some exact cases and some exact practices 
that I'm aware of that we approved that might give you a head start and give you a good insight so, so that you don't have to go to the other end of the spectrum where you're listening to tapes. Would that help? Uh, we do respect and appreciate Roy's uh, uh, value on our time. We do have a lot of plans and we, we are doing a lot of things, uh, but we would be more than happy to, to get you what, whatever is necessary. Okay. All right, Mr. Dale, uh, I'm willing to amend my motion for the way you described it. If uh, if you're uh, if someone is willing to second it, second your motion, sir. Mr. Chairman, this is Michael. Okay. Um, Mr. Hunt, go ahead, because that may help Mr. Dale. Or I, I'm sorry, I've lost next. the ability with my software to raise my hand, but I did want to interject. <laughs> That's okay. we, we, we can certainly do what you're asking. I do think from listening, I would echo Steve's remarks if there could be a little bit of uh, maybe uh, some written communication of exactly what you're looking for. But the one thing that does come to mind that maybe uh, the committee could think about in couching that is that the thing that makes standardization difficult on these is the fact they're all different. So even yeah. sites that in their, you know, do qualify as previously being in zone one, a lot of times they are all different. So I just wanted to put that little caveat in that, that even when we do something like this, at some level, they all have to be considered on their own merits. But uh, yeah. I'm sure y'all know that anyway. Yes, Thank sir. you. Sometimes there's not a parking lot. <laughs> That's right. We don't need pervious paving. All right. Ms. Okay, Ms. Dale. Uh, if you're looking for a fact and a fact in your motion. <laughs> All right. So, so like, you, like you said, let's put something in writing so that the staff knows clearly what we're looking for. And if, if for some reason they don't have time uh, if they'll, you know, just tell us that at the next meeting, then they can, you know, have another, we'll give them more time. Yeah. And I, I'm not wedded, I'm not wedded to the next meeting. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll certainly accept the friendly amendment that, uh, that the timing is flexible based upon staff availability during this very, uh, crazy period of, of uh, work in All right, Mr. Michoud, did, no, did you want to say something out? No. Yes, sir, okay, I so we got, a, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, if I'm gonna try to read your mind, I know we had a case that was very interesting about an existing development, well, existing buildings that were uh, in the buffers and yes. they did not have necessarily all state and federal approvals and we still brought it to the committee. And we promised that we would bring that back to you to just uh, as an okay. FYI, uh, let you know that it, it does meet the, uh, what was approved. Uh, however, that one has not been approved yet, and therefore we have not brought it back. But I didn't want you guys to think, or, or the committee members to think, that we haven't forgot about that project as well. Now that that was actually not on my immediate mind, but thank you for reminding me. It should be. <laughs> but that's kind of like a kid confessing to taking candy out of the candy jar before they had to, right? <laughs> All right, so. Uh, uh, I certainly don't want to create more work for you, Steve. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm primarily concerned with applicants having to guess. You know, there, there's all kinds of precedent out there, legal precedent out there from the court system concerning giving um, proper information related to investor-backed expectations, so they don't get out on the limb. And waste a lot of money, waste a lot of time because they don't understand how to how to come forward with an appropriately uh, uh, designed proposal or a, or a variance. They need to understand our our expectations. And I've had the sense lately that we've we're we've spun our wheels a bit, which eats into the time for the next case and the time for the next thing on the agenda and the time for us getting back to our lives. As public, as unpaid public servants in this process, that uh, that uh, often we end up asking staff to figure out the details of, and if we could 
come up with a little clearer expectations to keep the burden on the applicant. Uh, I think, uh, and to give the applicant the best possible way to, to understand what they need to propose, I think it'll, it'll make it everybody's life easier because it's the applicant that's creating the need to, uh, for the issue to be addressed. And if they can solve it for us before they get here, that would be, a, that, with staff's guidance, that would be a great help. So I'll, I'll take it upon myself to uh, articulate this. I'll share it with the committee before I share it with staff to make sure uh, y'all are okay with the way I'm crafting it and uh, assuming that this motion will pass and then uh, and then we'll get together with staff and we'll keep the timeline flexible uh, uh, when we do it. All right, based on workload. So we got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right. So let's, uh, why don't we proceed to vote? So, um, oh, where's my roll call? Okay. Ms. Stokes, how do you vote? In favor. All right. Um, Mr. Dale. Yes. All right. Ms. Maddox. Yes. Ms. Adams Taylor. Yes. Dr. Gomez Velez. In favor. Okay. We have unanimous consent. And I will uh, I'll follow up on that. Motion passes. All right. Any other business anyone wants to present? Mr. Hunt. Very, very quickly, I did want to pass along uh, in relation to some recent FEMA meetings that we have. The last case I know involves some flood proofing, and I wanted to mention that Metro uh, Water is going to be more intentional in tracking those going forward. So there'll be some manner of evaluation after the fact throughout time. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to recognize our staff, Rebecca, Steve, uh, Terry, and, and especially Penny. Uh, the logistics on the governor's executive order relating to electronic meetings this month, uh, it, it created a few issues. And I just want to thank them for all the work they did this week to make sure this meeting was able to go forward and happen in a legally appropriate manner. Thank you all. Thanks, sir. All right. Um, and I saw one other hand raised, Ms. Uh, Maddox. Did you want to say something? Oh, I was going to make a motion to adjourn. Oh, that one supersedes all other motions. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a second? I will second that motion. So I'm putting my pajamas back on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dale. We got a motion made and probably seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And I actually, I forgot that we actually didn't have to take a vote because of the nature of of the current COVID situations. Anyway, glad we have a consensus that we're ready to adjourn. We are officially adjourned. Thank you for your participation. I apologize for getting sloppy in the beginning, but uh, I really do appreciate your patience. Thank you, homeowner Thanks, staff and everyone. IT staff. Another amazing Thanks. job. Thank you, Kenneth. Thanks, everyone. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.